This video is sponsored by longtime partners of the show, Skillshare, an online learning community with thousands of classes on everything from business all the way to creative writing and design. So we're about halfway through the year now, and if you're still looking to try something new and creative, then it is not too late. Exploring your passions doesn't need to be limited to New Year's resolutions, and if you're looking for a place to start, then I'd like to suggest Productivity for Creatives Build a System That Brings Out Your Best by Thomas Frank. I really do think that pinning down your own custom work style is incredibly important instead of trying to do whatever it is people say you should be doing because of any number of vague reasons. Now, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Thank you so much to Skillshare for their continued support, and with that said, let's begin. Welcome to episode one of Stories from Our Disturbing World, the series where we take a tour of the dark side of reality. And in this episode, we look at five real life tales dealing in everything from celebrity cult activity all the way to one Redditor's terrifying discovery. As the title suggests, the content of this video can be disturbing to some viewers, and as such, viewer discretion is advised. High school is awkward, and I'm not going to pretend that you didn't already know that. In many ways, whether we'd like to admit it or not, this stage in life is actually terrifying. You're suddenly getting a glimpse of what it'll take to seemingly fit into society while simultaneously dealing with massive changes within yourself, be it physical changes or just trying to figure out who you really are or what you'd like to do with your life. A lot of this pondering, gossip, self-reflection, and contemplation will all take place within the boundaries of the hallways, something that was also true for 14-year-old Philip Chisholm in the moments leading up to an event that would change his and the lives of several others forever. When a crime is committed, there unfortunately isn't always obvious proof of who did it and how, but in the case of tonight's first story, most of it was captured via CCTV, at some points in chilling detail. Danvers High School, Danvers, Massachusetts, October 22nd, 2013. At 2.54 p.m., we see a smiling woman emerge from a classroom and begin heading down the hall towards a bathroom. This would be Colleen Ritzer, Philip Chisholm's 24-year-old math teacher. Just after she leaves, Philip appears from the same classroom, tails her down the hallway and eventually into the same bathroom. As you can see, Philip managed to wheel in a large trash bin, and now he's removing it from the premises. The thing is, Colleen Ritzer, as you probably already guessed, is unfortunately in there. Her body was later found in the nearby woods, almost entirely nude, with slash marks across her throat and a branch that was used to sexually assault her still left in place. Where Colleen actually died is unclear. It's believed that she was knocked out in the bathroom, but remained alive until she was wheeled out to the woods, where Philip would carry out the rest of his sick plan before stealing her credit card and casually using it to see a movie and to buy himself dinner. Again, this all in the same day he murdered his teacher, defiled her corpse, then left it in the woods to rot. Before we close this off, I do want to point out a couple of unusual things where Philip's behavior is concerned. First, notice his body language here. He seems to hesitate before checking his left pocket. He hesitates again, briefly dipping back into Colleen's classroom before emerging hooded despite the fact that this does nothing to conceal his identity. Just a few seconds later, we see that he's donning gloves, pretty much proving that this was premeditated despite a clear motive never truly being offered. According to Philip in later testimony, this had to do with Colleen supposedly insulting him and his taking power back, at least in his mind. Roughly 10 minutes after Philip first entered the woman's restroom, he exits, startling a female student in the process. He keeps his hood up, his head down, and then leaves the building. Upon return, his blue hoodie is gone, but Philip returns to the classroom to pick up another change of clothes and several bags. 
He puts on a red hoodie this time, along with a ski mask, which he just as quickly removes before running down the hallway yet again. Moments later, he returns with a trash bin that would soon contain his teacher. Upon emerging from the bathroom for a second time, Philip's red hoodie is now gone, and he's once again donned the ski mask, only to switch it up again seconds later, exposing the top of his head and face. By the time he's outside, he seems to take up the opposite configuration, with his mouth and chin exposed as he walks past a bystander. About an hour later, Philip returns to the building, his pants covered in blood and his shoes missing. Again, half his face is still exposed. Philip soon dips away into a different bathroom, changes into entirely different clothing, then goes about his day like I mentioned a second ago. Again, his behavior is extremely bizarre, especially when you take into account that he left his bloody clothes at the scene along with a backpack that contained his ID card and a note that said, I hate you all. On top of this, he decided to keep the bloody box cutter used in the attack and Colleen's ID and underwear, which police later found upon his arrest. In some ways, there did seem to be a calculated, premeditated effort to hide evidence, but at the same time, it's hard to believe he was unaware of security cameras, which, as you saw, had him covered from every angle. It's no surprise that authorities had no trouble pinning this on Philip, who was ultimately tried as an adult and charged with a life sentence. It's probably also no surprise that just a year after Colleen's murder, Philip would try to kill yet again. But instead of a school teacher, this time his intended victim was a youth worker, one employed where Philip was being held pending his trial. Luckily, this time the boy wasn't successful and instead only landed himself another charge this time attempted murder. It's hard to say what exactly this story leaves us with. It's hard to imagine that someone at the young age of 14, someone barely even a teenager, could be so dangerous and do something so heinous, all seemingly without remorse. Many would love to believe that they'd be able to catch all the warning signs, all the red flags, maybe even help and possibly prevent these sorts of tragedies if only they could. And while that's all in good intent, as we know, that's unfortunately not how things usually play out. And while it seems like justice was served in this case, the Ritzer family isn't convinced. This due to the fact that while Philip was given a life sentence, as I mentioned, he was also granted a chance at parole. To anyone, myself included, the idea of someone as unhinged as Philip being back on the streets is absolutely terrifying, but for Colleen's family, it's heartbreaking. Keep in mind, Colleen was young herself, only in her mid-twenties when her life was ultimately taken from her. As we all know, online predators are everywhere. Be it Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Discord, TikTok, Instagram, you name it. No matter the platform, there will always be adults using it with the intent to lure an underaged individual into a relationship. The problem is seemingly never-ending, and there unfortunately seems to be no real solution in sight. From time to time, we'll hear about stories of alleged predators in the news. The most prominent in recent memory has been the story of Onision, who I'm sure you've all heard is being investigated by none other than To Catch a Predator host, Chris Hansen. Not too long ago, we heard a similar case from a YouTuber named Austin Jones, who has since gone on to become a convicted sex offender. The point is, these days we're very aware of the adult with a fanbase who lures in underage fans, but what about predators who aren't famous, who don't have the lure of celebrity to aid them? What methods do they use and how can we watch out for them? What if they masquerade as the very people they prey upon? This is the now defunct Instagram page of a user called Nora the Wolf. Notice how this person's bio says they're 16 and female. Here, we see that the account has over 2.7k followers, but at one point, that number was as high as 7,000. So, what happened? Well, Nora made friends. A good amount of them, actually, specifically within a niche pocket of Instagram's art community. Many of Nora's followers were, as one might expect, young artists looking to connect with other young artists. Nora was able to fit right in, quickly engaging in private conversations with many of her colleagues from around the community, usually hailing from around the 13 to 15 age bracket. Nora was very forward, not shy at all. 
In screenshots of her conversations, we see that she very quickly asks some very personal and inappropriate questions pretty much right off the bat. In this case, for example, Nora issues a list of questions. What's your full name? What school do you go to? Are your parents strict or protective? Nora even asks this person if they've ever done certain explicit acts. The user answers each question, then Nora asks how old they are, 13 being the answer. Nora claims to be 14 and then asks for a picture of the 13-year-old. The 13-year-old complies. Nora compliments them on their appearance, asks if they've ever considered modeling, and then suggests copying poses from pictures. This is the image that Nora suggests that, again, a 13-year-old should emulate. As you can see from the screenshot, the young girl is obviously uncomfortable, but Nora tries to ease the pressure by saying it would somehow be funny. Now, the thing is, teenagers do this kind of stuff all the time, whether or not parents want to believe it. We've all been young, and we've all shared embarrassing conversations with friends, be it in person or via text. The thing is, though, the 13-year-old girl in this case was under the impression that her new friend was someone just like her. Only, Nora wasn't actually a girl. In conversations with other underage users, Nora admitted to being a male, as you can see here. Oddly enough, in a later conversation, Nora gets his story mixed up, once again claiming to be female, only to disappear once confronted about it. On another occasion with yet another underage user, Nora sent over a video, one depicting himself fully nude with his genitals exposed. What makes all of this even worse, as if inappropriate prying questions weren't bad enough, Nora wasn't even 14 or 16 like the profile says. In fact, this person, going by the name Nora, wasn't even a teenager. After word got around about this person's reputation and behavior, it eventually came to light that they were in their 20s, somewhere between 24 to 26, and after enough pressure from the community, Nora confessed to being a 24-year-old man. Of course, this doesn't necessarily guarantee that Nora is in fact 24. He could very easily be a number of years older or even younger, but at this point it almost doesn't even matter because believe it or not, this isn't the end of Nora's rap sheet. By the time all of this came to light, there was an estimated count of at least 10 underage victims of Nora who were willing to come forward and offer screenshots, but based on Nora's activity in the community and later taunting of those who called him out, the number could actually be much higher. As discussed a second ago, Nora had a habit of asking for pictures, and unfortunately, in many cases, he was successful at obtaining them. That's one thing, obviously, and regardless of Nora's age, there could be CP charges involved, but the thing that really bugged people about this was the fact that Nora had a nasty habit of sharing these risque photos, in some cases posting them publicly to his account and refusing to take them down when asked. There was one infamous scenario where an individual confronted Nora about his actions, and upon being called out, Nora once again resorted to taunting the user by spamming them with the many photos collected from various minors. In case you think it ends here, it still doesn't. Nora was very well known for having certain fantasies and trying to push them on people, again notably minors who weren't comfortable at all with the idea. Many times asking young artists to draw Nora's avatar forcing themselves onto other users' OCs, something that seemed to be fueled by the intent to cause discomfort for the other person depicted. Like I mentioned at the start of all this, Nora's Instagram is now defunct and he's largely believed to be in jail, something supposedly confirmed by the community which claims that one of his underage victims was able to get the authorities involved. Of course, there is no way to 100% confirm this without doxing the victim, so for now we're just going to have to be happy with the fact that Nora seems to be gone. I do want to note that the Nora rabbit hole does run deep, and while I did touch on the main points here, there is still a lot more to look up if you want to know more. YouTubers like Repzilla, Creepshow Art, and Nani have some really good coverage of this made closer to when everything was actually unfolding, and I'd also like to thank OBIJ Official for helping me figure out a lot of the details of this case. If you haven't heard of this page, it regularly posts alerts about accounts like Nora's, and in general does a really good job of upping the awareness about these lesser-known predators accounts. Even though Nora seems to be gone, it's always a good idea to keep your guard up because while big name cases get the most attention, as we all know, they're unfortunately far from the only predators out there.
Bedrooms are, of course, by far the most personal rooms in any home. A sanctuary away from the world. A guaranteed space for us to retreat to at the end of each long day. This comes with certain expectations, namely comfort, safety, and privacy. And when those things are violated, it can feel like you've had something ripped away. Stolen, even. After all, what good is a home without peace of mind? For one Redditor, this would become an unfortunate reality, one that wasn't even brought to light until after it happened, but still within the time frame for danger to be looming just around the corner. The story is told in a single photograph. What is this? My daughter took this image at 11.56pm with my wife's iPhone. Me and my wife were both asleep and no one else lives here but us. Plus, the light is strange because the lights were off. And the image was taken from the room to the living room. Those who commented were disturbed, and rightfully so. They asked the OP questions to gain better context. There we learn that OP is from the US, and oddly enough, his daughter, age 4, doesn't actually remember taking the image. The assumption being that she was half asleep while doing so. He and his wife, of course, aren't responsible for the image either. Looking at the figure, it seems almost impossible that it can be anything other than a person, one that seems to be holding a flashlight. When asked if maybe OP or his wife were sleepwalkers, he points out that these silhouettes fit none of their body types. Of course, the next logical conclusion would be that this midnight intruder was some kind of burglar, but what makes that theory seemingly go out the window is the fact that nothing was stolen, and to make matters worse, there wasn't any obvious signs of forced entry or anything left unlocked. So this person, whoever they are, found a much more inconspicuous path into the home. While it may seem impossible for someone to gain access to a home in such a stealthy manner, other accounts online will tell us it's actually not as uncommon as one might think. A user posited the theory that maybe what we had on our hands was a squatter, someone, a complete stranger, living in their home right under their noses. They linked this famous clip as an example, one that most of you have probably already seen. The family decided to go to police while also opting to up their home security, but unfortunately we haven't received any updates. This could be a red flag to some that maybe think that this is all a hoax, but based on Opie's history, there really isn't anything to suggest a pattern of that behavior. On top of that, this post was from months ago. One would assume that if this was fake, they'd be coming back to take advantage of it to some degree. But either way, the image is still chilling, and something that we very much know to be a terrifying reality in the world we live in. And it goes without saying that if this picture really is genuine, then this family is really quite lucky because for many others who've experienced this, the results have unfortunately turned grim. In late 2014, an unknown individual hopped on a cab in Fiji. Upon leaving, this person, as most of us do from time to time, forgot their cell phone. The cab driver later notices this and naturally begins to comb through it. For most people, there's an expectation that at worst, you find nothing. But at best, you may be able to find the owner if you're so inclined to return the device. Instead, however, the cab driver uncovers something unspeakable, and most likely heavily traumatizing. Per the natural course of these things, what the cab driver found leaked onto YouTube and would draw in the attention of thousands of horrified online users. The 10 minute video, titled Fishing Vessel, Fijian Crew Getting Shot Outside Fiji, was inaccurate in its detail aside from one point. The video did, in fact, feature a small group of men at sea being systematically murdered. The low quality clip opens to the color blue, and the sound of multiple voices overstepping one another in a foreign language, one of which is being broadcast via a speaker system. A slight pan reveals several other large vessels in the surrounding waters. Following this, the cameraman focuses in on the waters once again, and it becomes apparent that there's a man overboard. And while most would expect a rescue to begin, instead, we start to hear gunshots as explosions of water begin appearing around the man until he's ultimately struck. A small wooden boat is also present. It's tipped over and around three or four other men can be seen hanging on. They too are being picked off one by one. 
As stated earlier, and if the description of this hasn't already made it clear, this video is incredibly graphic and shocking, something that I definitely would not recommend that you Google unless you're absolutely sure about it. But the thing is, there's one more piece of the story that adds to its horror. After the events unfold and a handful of men were executed in cold blood, the killers don't only show their faces, but actually get together and pose for photos. <laughs> Immediately following this video's publication, the Fijian authorities began investigating, but it would soon become clear that this case didn't involve them as much as initially believed. One of the ships surrounding the scene was quickly identified as Taiwanese, and its owner told the New York Times in 2014 that his ships left the scene as soon as possible, presumably as to not get involved. He also refused to release any further details, but he did say that he's of the opinion that the footage was from 2013 and took place in the Indian Ocean. This based on the ship's schedules. As for the offending ship and its crew, many of the comments point to the men speaking a mixture of Chinese, Indonesian, and Vietnamese, although some others dispute this. At the time of this story breaking, the generally accepted theory was that these victims were pirates who were executed for self-defense. The men in the waters in the video don't appear to be armed, but by the time the camera finds them, their boat had already been tipped over, their weapons now gone if any had been present earlier. Unfortunately, this case was never solved, and once the Fijian government realized that it really didn't take place in their waters or involve their citizens, they dropped it. Given the murky reality of jurisdiction, this case has been left to individuals. One such person is author Ian Urbina, who spent years at sea in order to write his 2019 book, Outlaw Ocean. According to an article by The Guardian, in it, Urbina claims that the men who were murdered weren't pirates at all, but actually Pakistani fishermen. If true, this makes this case even more chilling and incomprehensible. It's unclear if any more info could be gathered on the cell phone where the clip was found or even its owner. The men, even having shown their faces, have not been identified, and videos and images taken at the scene by others present seemingly have never made their way to the internet. In theory, an alternative angle of the shot should be out there somewhere, or maybe even the image these two can be seen taking here. Unfortunately, however, at the end of the day, no government body or organization is interested in pursuing this, again, mainly due to the complicated issue of jurisdiction. If any of you recognize these men, which someone has to, at the end of the day, sadly, there simply is no one to report it to. Cults are seen as an extremely hot topic these days, and it's safe to say that most of us probably never see ourselves ever falling victim to cult brainwashing, especially those of us who are non-religious. It comes with a sense of invincibility and immunity where cults are concerned. After all, if you aren't even into your common religions, how could you ever end up in a cult? What a lot of people miss, however, is that while in terms of structure they may remain the same, not all cults are about gods or doomsday, and non-religious cults can be just as dangerous as Jonestown or Heaven's Gate. Cults as a subject come with a lot of mystique despite how long they've been at the forefront of popular culture. We still wonder to ourselves what it is they do behind closed doors, how much they get away with before they ultimately fall in what always seems to be a stereotypically horrible fashion. Sometimes we even wonder if, low-key, people of power or fame could be involved before brushing it off as mere conspiracy theory. In the case of Nexium, however, this was all reality. They were a modern-day, non-religious cult that preyed on the affluent, famous, and socially powerful, all under the guise of self-improvement, something that basically all of us are looking for no matter your religion, race, or how you identify. Nexium, on the surface, was a company dedicated to wellness and healing, something they claimed to help you work towards with their transformational workshops, hosted by other companies that operated within the Nexium umbrella. 
On official terms, Nexium was technically a multi-level marketing company that began operations in 1998. Its founder, a man by the name of Keith Ranieri, who would later be convicted of sex trafficking, conspiracy, and conspiracy to commit forced labor, amongst others. Nexium was free to run rampant for years, and while there were allegations of the company being a cult from as early as the mid-2000s, the story didn't reach its peak until 2017, when the New York Post released this article. Inside a selective group where women are branded. This is literally something that happened to what were basically the elite within Nexium, an invite-only sect called DOS, DOS, or The Vow a group that unknowingly served as Keith Raniere's personal harem. According to the women of DOS, they were recruited from the wider body of Nexium members, lured in with promises of exclusivity, sisterhood, and proximity to leader Keith Raniere, the man they were brainwashed into believing held the key to their personal improvement and well-being, a man they were to refer to as Vanguard when he conducted his seminars. Keith surrounded himself with wild and outlandish claims. He was a self-identified prodigy, a judo champion, philosopher, scientist, and just about everything else you could think of that would beef up your personal resume. The man even claimed to be enlightened, and in 2009, secured a visit from the Dalai Lama himself, something that definitely helped push the image of Nexium's credibility. Again, a number of rich and powerful people were involved with this group to some degree. Sarah Bronfman is one example, a daughter of a billionaire businessman. Her sister Claire was also involved and ultimately arrested in connection to Nexium. At one point, it's said that the billionaire heiresses aided Nexium in trying to recruit fellow billionaire Richard Bronson, although according to Bronson's management, they were ultimately unsuccessful. Former Hawaii Five-0 actress Grace Park can be seen on camera having conversations with Keith Raniere. This format with interchanging individuals was once a hallmark of Nexium social media presence. It should be noted that according to Park's management, there was no way for her to know of the extent of Nexium's actions since she wasn't specifically involved in DOS. Perhaps the most famous example of celebrity involvement within Nexium is actress Allison Mack, seen by many as Keith Raniere's right-hand woman. Some might even argue that she was the top dog in the DOS food chain. Upon the FBI crackdown, Mack was convicted of many of the same crimes as Keith Raniere. The list goes on and on, and it's scary to think just how much influence these people had, both financially and socially. Just how easy it is for a public figure to lure their audience into a cult, where in some cases you're referred to as a slave and tasked with recruiting your own so-called slaves. This was language mandated for members of the DOS circle, and how the group would slowly grow, again not realizing that all they really were was Keith Raniere's personal harem. The branding that would become the center of the media's focus and subsequently public outrage, and rightfully so, was part of DOS's initiation ceremony. What was that like? It was worse than childbirth. Imagine a hot laser dragged across your flesh for 30 minutes without anesthetic. Survivors later revealed that they were told they would receive a small tattoo, not a branding, and to make this even worse, they weren't told what image would be permanently etched into their skin. What it ended up being was something most would consider esoteric. At first, no one really noticed, but upon further inspection, members began to speculate that the bizarre symbol was actually made up of Keith Raniere's initials. The Nexium rabbit hole is deep and seemingly never-ending. The story has been covered by a number of different entities in a number of different venues, and while we all wish that what happened to these women will never happen again to anyone else, the sobering reality of cults is that they very much still exist, even in 2020, and they're evolving. In some ways, even getting sneakier using new methods and media to trap and manipulate their victims. For the rest of us, the best we can do is keep an eye out, both for ourselves and for our loved ones, understanding that there should never be any obligation to serve any person or organization to the point of discomfort or worse, physical or mental injury. Welcome to episode 2 of Stories from Our Disturbing World, the series where we take a tour of the dark side of reality. And in this episode, we look at five real-life tales dealing in everything from a narrow escape from a stalker, all the way to a quarantine that lasted over 100 years. As the title suggests, the content of this video can be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. 
It goes without saying that lately the world has been turned upside down, and normal day-to-day -day life as we know it has basically come to a screeching halt. COVID-19, as you all surely know, is the reason why. But we're not here to talk about that tonight. Instead, I'd like to turn your attention to an illness considered by many now to be a thing of the past, and the impact it had on my home, Hawaii. A disease that resulted in the forced quarantine via exile for thousands of Hawaiians who would never see their homes or their loved ones ever again. In the mid-1800s, Hawaii was a much, much different place from the one that it is today. Back then, it wasn't a part of America, not as a state nor as a territory, but rather, it was its very own kingdom. On the bright side of things, the country was experiencing an economic boom thanks to the sugarcane industry and the success of its plantations. But on the other hand, however, was a new disease. Leprosy, to be exact. On official terms, leprosy is known as Hansen's disease and has been around for as long as humankind can remember. No one knows for sure exactly where it started or when, but what we do know in this modern age is that it's caused by a bacterial infection. The results of leprosy are both catastrophic and heartbreaking, the most common hallmarks being physical deformities, skin sores, muscle weakness, and nerve damage that can ultimately amount to horrifying results for patients. According to leprosy.org, the bacteria attack nerve endings and destroy the body's ability to feel pain and injury. Without feeling pain, people injure themselves and the injuries can become infected, resulting in tissue loss. Fingers and toes become shortened and deformed as the cartilage is absorbed into the body. Repeated injury and infection of numb areas in the fingers or toes can cause bones to shorten. The tissues around them shrink, making them short. Bacteria entering the mucus lining of the nose can lead to internal damage and scarring, which in time causes the nose to collapse. If the facial nerve is affected, a person loses the blinking reflex of the eye, which can eventually lead to dryness, ulceration, and blindness. Not everybody became blind, but many. When you felt yourself going blind and knowing that others at the settlement tended to be shut-ins once they were blind, did you tell anyone? I keep robbing you. Mama, you heard me. She said, yes, son. She continues robbing. Each time it's getting harder and harder. Mama, Mama, I'm blind. And I could hear her sobbing as she was robbing harder and harder. And my daddy, I can tell when he's crying, he starts sniffling, you know. These are exactly the conditions thousands of Hawaiians were suffering from in the mid-1800s, something made especially terrifying given the fact that the native population had no history with the disease before the arrival of Westerners. To them, this was entirely unprecedented, and given the era, there was no known cure. In fact, a solution wouldn't become known to the world until nearly a century later. As mass panic across the kingdom began to swell, the government took action. And in 1865, the act to prevent the spread of leprosy of the nation of Hawaii was passed, approved by King Kamehameha V. According to historical accounts, this act in essence criminalized leprosy. Citizens who either had the disease or were suspected of having it were rounded up and abandoned in a remote area called Kalaupapa on the island of Molokai. To most of you, this probably looks like a stereotypical depiction of paradise, but Kalaupapa was chosen due to its nearly inescapable cliffs, and without any resources to build boats or canoes, the otherwise beautiful waters were deadly. Keep in mind, the process of arriving at the Kalaupapa settlement in itself was already heavily traumatizing. First, you're arrested simply for being ill, but on top of that, you're also ripped away from your family, and in many cases, it was actually children who were being taken away. You were then examined, oftentimes fully nude by several individuals at once. Then you were placed on a boat. Many, already mentally broken, refused to disembark, resulting in them being thrown overboard and made to swim the rest of the way to shore. This all while being terribly ill, and as mentioned earlier, oftentimes having open sores or wounds caused by the illness. It's said that quite a few people drowned before ever making it to land, but those who did survive did not have it easy. Ambrose Hutchinson, a resident of the Kalaupapa settlement from 1879 to 1932, wrote, 
After our names, ages, and places we hailed from were taken down, we were left on the rocky shore without food and shelter. No houses provided by the government for the likes of us outcasts. Another resident, this time unnamed, stated, Like the other patients, they caught me at school. I was on the Big Island. I was 12 then. I cried like the Dickens for my mother and for my family, but the Board of Health didn't waste no time in those days. They sent me to Kalaupapa. That's where they sent most of us. Most came to die. Most came to die. Here's what that meant. People being forcibly taken from family is already bad enough, but to make things even worse, those who were sent to Kalaupapa were never allowed to return home. Many that were taken as children grew up on the settlement and eventually passed away as adults, all without ever seeing their families or homes ever again. Some even mentioned not being able to remember who they were related to. Being sent to Kalaupapa was basically a death sentence. In the 1940s, a successful treatment for leprosy finally became available, and while this should have been great news for the residents of Kalaupapa, it wasn't. The quarantine and exile still remained in place despite most patients having been cured. By 1959, Hawaii became the 50th U.S. state, but even being a part of America, for some reason, wasn't enough to end the exile. In fact, it would be a whole 10 years later in 1969 when the isolation laws were finally lifted and those living in Kalaupapa could finally leave. Now, it goes without saying that all the early residents at the settlement unfortunately passed away at Kalaupapa, but some of the later ones are still alive today and, believe it or not, still voluntarily live exactly where they were once forced to. In many ways, while this story is about disease and its physical horrors, there's also a lot to be said about its social horrors as well. Hawaii was far from the only place to unjustly treat those suffering from leprosy. All over the world, those with a disease were treated as subhuman, dirty, even somehow of lower moral value, and while leprosy for the most part is quite rare these days, it still very much exists, and one can only hope that going forward we've learned a thing or two from our history and past mistakes about how to treat those significantly affected by illness. Sometimes, what's most disturbing isn't necessarily what you see, but rather, what you hear. It isn't what you know, but what you don't know that has the most potential to make your skin crawl. This entry features the most recent story of tonight's video. In fact, it occurred just a few months ago, specifically in late November 2019. To this day, however, there are no answers, no solutions, no way to make sense of what you're about to hear. At the beginning of this video, I issued a warning about disturbing content, and I feel the need to reissue it before we proceed. If you find the sound of someone in extreme distress upsetting, then I highly suggest skipping forward. This clip was posted to YouTube by the Los Angeles Police Department on November 14th, 2019. Its description explains what's happening here, at least to the extent that it could. At 11.20 p.m., witnesses on the 3000 block of 3rd Avenue heard a female screaming, help me, somebody help me. At the same time, witnesses observed a possible four-door white Prius with two occupants inside speed off southbound on 3rd Avenue. A female, black, with dark braided hair, identified as victim Jane Doe, was believed to be in the front passenger seat and the suspect in the driver's seat. Witness 1 observed Jane Doe's hair being pulled backwards as she was screaming. Witness 1 observed plastic wrap over the front passenger side window from a possible prior traffic collision. The suspect was heard shouting, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This, unfortunately, is the extent of what we know about this case. Since we can't see exactly what happened and neither could witnesses, it's unsure if this was a domestic abuse case or possibly even a kidnapping. For the first two weeks after the incident, there seemed to be a fair amount of attention circulating around this case. News articles came out, a press conference was held, but despite all of this and a plea for more information, there just weren't any solid leads. 
The only update was to the car's description. It was not a white Prius, but rather a 2003 to 2008 Toyota Matrix, according to police. Many are quick to point out this woman and her seemingly nonchalant attitude as she stands there listening to this possible kidnapping. The public naturally assumed that she did nothing and neither did anyone else in this household. The thing is though, the video most people have seen is incomplete. In fact, the one I showed you is said incomplete version that everyone else saw as well. If you watch the extended version, immediately after the video cut off, a man, presumably this woman's husband, emerges from the home and takes off in an attempt to follow the Toyota Matrix. Based on the state of things now, however, it's safe to say that he unfortunately wasn't able to track them down. Like I said at the start of all this, there aren't any answers, and at this point the case seems to have been all but forgotten. Who exactly was Jane Doe and where is she now? Is she even still alive? It goes without saying that most cases like this unfortunately don't have a happy ending, so if by any chance you know something about this, or even if you just think you might, then please contact the authorities directly using the information you see here. If you're like me and have no way to help in terms of offering information, then what you can do is to keep the conversation about this case going. Tell a friend about it, show them the video posted by the LAPD, tweet about it, whatever you can do. I know that this case may not be the most headline-worthy, but it's something that collectively we can still at least try to do something about. Leatherface, Buffalo Bill American Horror Stories, Bloody Face. The trope of the serial killer who wears either a mask or a suit made of their victim's skin is classic at this point. But as many of you know, this ghoulish display has its roots set in America's very own dark history. It's impossible to mention these characters without bringing up killer and grave robber Ed Gein, who I'm sure you all know had an infamous tendency to create clothing, furniture, and other household furnishings out of human body parts. The thing is though, this was way back in the 1950s, and since then we really haven't seen another notable case involving a skin taker, at least not here in the US. January 1999. The day had just begun for a local tugboat operator tasked with repairing his vessel. Something was wrong with its propeller, sort of. The issue, truthfully, wasn't the propeller itself, but rather that something had gotten caught in it causing a jam. A pain, sure, but overall a simple fix, and not a surprise either. Things get caught in boat propellers all the time, be it nets or whatever other stray material finds its way into the waters. Upon inspection, however, the boat operator slowly grew more confused. Whatever was lodged in there didn't look like anything he'd ever seen before. It was pale, and on top of that, it was giving off a strong, foul-smelling odor. It was then that the man noticed something unspeakable. A human ear. Could someone have gotten caught in the propeller? People have died in such ways before, but that wasn't the case here because, well, it wasn't a full body that was lodged in the propeller, but rather skin. Just skin. And yes, it was human. Authorities were contacted immediately, and upon full extraction of the remains, it became apparent that what they had was a neatly removed skin from a female torso, with incisions made along the lines of the limbs, and for some reason, up to the neck and to the left ear. The nipples had also been removed, and a week later, a leg was found in the same river. DNA testing thankfully led to the identification of the remains, revealing that it belonged to one Katarzyna Zovada, a 23-year-old student at a nearby university who by that point had been missing since November of 1998. But who exactly was this girl, and how did she end up like this? Not much is known about Katarzyna, unfortunately, aside from the details of her grisly death and the subsequent murder investigation, but most sources describe this girl as having been shy and suffering from depression. She was also said to have dressed plainly and was an only child. Her father, unfortunately, had passed away a few years prior to her disappearance. The religious studies student lived with her mother, who realized that something was wrong after her daughter missed a routine psychiatric appointment, which they were supposed to attend together. On top of this, Katarzyna was known to be suicidal, and in fact had previously attempted to end her own life. This, of course, only made her disappearance all the more alarming. It also became apparent that Katarzyna had been skipping the last three weeks of class, something her friends believed was due to some kind of secret relationship. Overall, the murder investigation was 
was messy, to say the very least. There were a number of suspects and even a major red herring. Just a few months after Katarzyna's skin was discovered and rumors of this being a Silence of the Lambs copycat killing were running rampant, it seemed the killer had been revealed. A shocked elderly man had called the police with terrifying news. He'd found a beheaded body in his basement, and to make matters even worse, he speculated that his grandson was responsible. It's unclear whether or not the elderly man knew this at the time, but the corpse belonged to his son, and the killer was indeed his grandson, who not only killed and beheaded his father, but also skinned his face in order to make a mask. He later admitted to wearing it around the house, while also donning his dead father's clothes. Now, interestingly enough, this person actually attended the same university as Katarzyna, but it was ultimately determined by authorities that he had nothing to do with her murder. He, of course, was charged and eventually went on to serve his sentence in Russia, where he and his family had originally immigrated from. A number of other names were brought up, but every single one led to a dead end, and by the year 2000, the case had been closed. It wouldn't be until 12 years later that this case would be formally reopened. A cold case unit ordered re-examination of Katarzyna's remains with newer technology, and according to their later findings, they believe that the girl was actually tortured before being killed, and possibly even skinned alive. Over the course of this investigation, the FBI even stepped in to assist in the case, and from this came a psychological profile of the killer. The authorities then returned to an early person of interest, one called only by the name Robert J. by Polish media. Robert was actually brought up by various tips numerous times during the initial stages of the murder investigation. Many claimed that when they heard the news about a girl murdered and skinned, Robert was the first to come to mind. It was said that he hated women, and even had a record of harassing them, spying on them through windows, and writing unsolicited letters. It's still unknown if this Robert person and Katarzyna actually knew each other. Robert did frequent the same area, and had been known to take walks near the river where the skin was later uncovered, but to this day, Robert denies ever having known the girl. As mentioned earlier, Katarzyna was thought to have a secret relationship that started about three weeks before her disappearance. This not only due to her truancy, but also because she began to dress up and dyed her hair a different color, something that was uncharacteristic of her. Authorities, of course, leaned into the idea that this Robert person was Katarzyna's new romantic interest at the time, and that he had used this trust to lure her into his home and murder her in cold blood after senseless torture. Robert was 52 years old by the time he was arrested, something that came following a raid in which blood had been found in his bathroom. After examination, experts determined that with, quote, a possibility that borders uncertainty, that this was blood left behind by Katarzyna. On top of this, Robert had also previously worked in a dissection lab for a time, and he'd also held another job that involved prepping animal skins. As things stand right now, however, Robert J's official status is that of a suspect. For whatever reason, in late 2019, the courts requested a private trial, and as such, the outcome is not currently clear. By all accounts, Robert does seem to be the culprit, and we can hope that authorities got it right this time because it's horrifying to think that someone capable of torturing a young woman and skinning her alive was able to roam free for the better part of two decades. For many of us, the idea of being stalked is pure nightmare fuel, and rightfully so. But for countless individuals all over the world, the issue of stalking is no nightmare at all, but rather a reality. One that can slowly chip away at one's psyche, and at the very worst, even result in a life being cut short. In this entry, we're going to be taking a look at a viral 2019 case from Korea that, for one, thankfully didn't end up that way, and on top of that, also managed to be the catalyst for a nationwide debate centered on the issue of stalking and violence against women in general. We'll get to why in a second, but first, let's talk about the clip that made this incident blow up. The roughly 80 second clip opens with a hallway, and before too long, a young woman appears. She approaches her door, begins to open it, and then this happens.
As you just saw, the girl in this clip managed to escape, but only just barely. Had she had taken even a second longer, this man, who she has no relation with, would have been able to gain access to her home, and then who knows what could have happened. Immediately following this failed attempt to get in, the man then proceeds to linger, trying the doorknob a couple of times, knocking, and at some points he even appears to be trying to guess the door's passcode. Thankfully, he eventually gives up and leaves. This situation in and of itself is obviously horrifying enough, especially given how narrow of an escape this ended up being, but to make matters even worse, later footage obtained from the surrounding area shows us how the man was able to find the girl's residence. Here, he can be seen following her home, not all that far behind her. According to the media, the suspect turned himself in the next day. He claimed to be 30 years of age and drunk at the time, which led to him supposedly having no recollection of what happened. Initially, he was to be charged only with trespassing, but the Korean public, simply put, were not having it. While this was all taking place, the clip in question was hopping from platform to platform. Upon word that the man in said video was only to be charged with trespassing, a petition was formed. One that ultimately accrued nearly 80,000 signatures, prompting Korean authorities to also tack on an attempted rape charge. As for why the initial charge was so light, according to the authorities, no physical contact had been made, therefore no further charges were necessary. But of course, this is problematic for a number of reasons. For example, it's pretty clear from this video that the man intended to do more than just open a door. As for what exactly, no one can be sure aside from him, but to many, this whole situation was just too close for comfort, and not assigning him some kind of heftier charge just seemed absurd. Many note there being a problem with the overall system. According to the Korean Herald, the penalty for stalking, if it's even pursued at all, is shockingly low. Just $89. Under the law on punishment of minor offenses or consistent harassment, any person who requests a meeting or date by consistently attempting to approach another person or watches, follows, or secretly waits for someone against explicit will of that person can be punished with a fine not exceeding $89 or by misdemeanor imprisonment. It goes without saying that in terms of legality, there's quite a long way to go, and many are calling for immediate change, praying that the results won't be too little too late. It's horrifying enough to think that someone is watching you from just around the corner, but what's perhaps even more nightmarish than being stalked isn't that there's no one there to help you, but rather that there's no one truly willing to. At least, not until something absolutely horrific happens. This girl, as we all know, truly is lucky. We've all seen those viral videos of people licking ice cream or other things for views, and stuff like that makes it abundantly clear just how easy it is to tamper with products that are inevitably going to end up in someone's household. Obviously, licking ice cream and putting it back just makes you a terrible person even if you faked it, but that doesn't mean you're actually intending for anyone to get hurt. What if, however, someone who does want to cause mass harm gets the same idea? It's something we generally never think twice about. We assume the products we buy at grocery stores have been sealed and therefore are safe. But tampering is very much a real thing, and disturbing accounts can be found all over the world. Here in America, however, the most famous case of product tampering is probably what's been dubbed the Chicago Tylenol Murders. In the early hours of September 30th, 1982, tragedy would strike. Although it was a Thursday, 12-year-old Mary Kellerman wasn't in school, this due to the fact that she wasn't feeling well. Her parents, just like millions of others would, decided to treat her with extra-strength Tylenol. Mary's father, Dennis, described what happened next in a later interview with the Chicago Tribune. I heard her go into the bathroom. I heard the door close. Then I heard something drop. I went to the bathroom door. I called, Mary, are you okay? There was no answer. I called again. Mary, are you okay? There was still no answer, so I opened the bathroom door, and my little girl was on the floor unconscious. She was still in her pajamas. Mary was actually dead. Her tiny body unable to handle the more than lethal dose of potassium cyanide that was unbeknownst to her and her family, placed into the Tylenol she'd ingested just moments earlier. A few miles north of where this tragedy took place, a very similar story had begun to unfold. 
this just a couple of hours after young Mary Kellerman was officially pronounced dead. By this point, it was about noon. A postal worker by the name of Adam Janis had decided to take the day off from work. Much like Mary, he wasn't feeling well. After getting the all clear from work, he picked up some Tylenol, went home, took two, and tried to go to sleep. Of course, just moments later, Adam emerged from his bedroom, collapsed, and as you guessed, was soon dead. His entire family, as you can expect, were left stunned. They rushed over to Adam's residence upon hearing the news, and in the middle of the mourning and shock, Adam's younger brother Stanley also took two Tylenol from the same bottle Adam did just hours earlier. Stanley's wife, Teresa, took some as well. Needless to say, Stanley was soon dead. The family once again in total shock. Teresa, meanwhile, had fallen into a coma. Unfortunately, things still weren't improving, as two more women in different neighborhoods, Mary Reiner and Mary McFarlane, would also die that day after taking Tylenol. Two days later, on October 1st, Teresa would succumb to the poisoning and the seventh and final victim was also announced, a 35-year-old woman from Chicago named Paula Prince. It didn't take long at all for authorities to make the connection to Tylenol. There were, after all, witnesses and people who could confirm that most of the victims had taken the pills before suddenly passing away. What wasn't so easy, however, was figuring out how this happened. At first, authorities turned their attention to manufacturing, and after that was ruled out, it became apparent that someone, be it an individual or a group, did this as a coordinated attack on the public. This was mass murder. What came next was nothing short of mass hysteria. By October 5th, Johnson & Johnson called for a mass recall of Tylenol products, amounting to approximately 31 million bottles taken off shelves, the retail value of which was over 100 million at the time, about 265 million today. It goes without saying that this was a massive blow to the company. No one knew if there was more to come, and if so, if it would involve some other kind of product. Everything at grocery stores and pharmacies became questionable. What's maybe even darker about this whole situation is the fact that more poisonings did happen in the coming years, but they weren't carried out by the same person or group as the initial attacks. By 1986, for example, a 23-year-old woman in New York City died after, as you guessed, taking two Tylenol laced with cyanide. This method also became used to settle personal scores, like in another case, also from 1986, where a Washington woman named Stella Nickel used cyanide-laced Excedrin to kill her husband. In an attempt to cover up her tracks, she left a couple other poisoned bottles in stores, hoping it would resemble the work of another mass killer. This resulted in the death of a 40-year-old Sue Snow, a complete stranger with no relation to Stella or her husband. In the end, the person responsible for the original 1982 Tylenol murders was never found, and to this day, their identity still remains a mystery. It goes without saying that today, products on shelves and in stores are generally a lot safer. In fact, it was the Chicago Tylenol case that led to the tamper-proof safety seals you see on a lot of products today. But even with this added precaution, however, there are still an endless number of ways food, medicine, and even other products can be messed with. I'm sure you've all noticed that even in 2020, not all products come with tamper-proof seals, an issue brought up in America's very own town hall, aka Twitter, after the ice cream licking videos went viral. It goes without saying that if you buy something meant to be consumed and it somehow doesn't look right, for as stereotypical as this saying is, it's still true. Better safe than sorry, because you never really know what kind of monsters are out there waiting to ruin lives for absolutely no reason. Welcome to episode 3 of Stories from Our Disturbing World, the series where we take a tour of the dark side of reality. And in this episode, we look at five real-life tales dealing in everything from a tragic family cult, all the way to a case so heinous it's often mistaken for fiction. As the title suggests, the content of this video is disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. On March 12, 2004, Fresno police were called to 761 West Hammond Avenue, a residence belonging to one Marcus Wesson and his unusually large family. Initially, this was meant to be a call regarding custody, as several Wesson children were inside the home. Their mothers, yes plural, were attempting to remove them from Marcus's care, or lack thereof, as we'll soon discuss. 
Marcus at first gave the illusion of being cooperative. He agreed to hand the kids over, but quickly changed course, barricading himself and the entire family inside, only to surrender over an hour and a half later. The thing is, however, by that point it was actually too late. Once police gained access to the home, what they walked in on was absolutely horrifying. Nine bodies were stacked one on top of another in a manner that resembled cordwood, according to one officer who was on the scene. Each victim was one of Marcus's own children, most of which were between the ages of one and eight. They were mortally wounded via gunshot wound to the head, specifically through an eye. Also found in the home were several antique coffins. Now, this was already shocking enough, but it would soon become known to the public that there was much more to the story than meets the eye. Something especially apparent once you learn that most of the murdered children who died that day were born out of incest, parented by Marcus and his own daughters and nieces. As it turns out, what Fresno had on their hands wasn't just a domestic dispute, but an entire reclusive family cult led by a man who believed not only in vampires, but that he himself was a god, something he taught his many children to believe from the day they were born. Marcus D. Wesson was born in Kansas on August 22, 1946, to a strict, abusive father and a religious fanatic mother who brought up her children in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Wessons eventually found themselves relocating, specifically to California, where Marcus would spend the majority of his life, save for a brief deployment overseas during the Vietnam War. Upon Marcus's return to California, he met a married mother by the name of Rosemary Solorio, who would soon leave her life for Marcus, and by 1971, the pair would have their first child together. Rosemary, as mentioned earlier, already had children from her previous marriage. One of them, Elizabeth, became the center of fixation for Marcus. Years earlier, when Elizabeth was just eight years old, Marcus announced that she was to be his bride, something he claimed was made clear by God himself. The two, of course, couldn't legally wed, but Marcus was content to have a home wedding. Rosemary, meanwhile, allowed for this to happen to her child, even telling her it was okay. This was when the sexual abuse started, and by 1974, 15-year-old Elizabeth was due to have her first child with Marcus, age 28. Once the two were finally able to legally marry, Rosemary would fade into the background, and from this point on, Elizabeth would be used by Marcus as a means to produce as many children as possible. Over the next decade or so, Elizabeth would give birth a staggering 11 times. Elizabeth would later tell reporters that none of this bothered her at the time. She believed everything Marcus said about their union, God, and life itself. She noted that since she was raised with the man, she had no way to know that what he was teaching her, and eventually their many children, was actually his own perverted brand of religion that no one else practiced. As you may have gathered, Marcus's beliefs were bizarre, to say the very least. Although he was brought up in the Seventh-day Adventist church, his personal beliefs would begin to mutate at a young age. As a teen, he began to speak of polygamy, something not traditionally practiced at his church, and perhaps most puzzlingly, he adopted the belief that Jesus Christ was actually a vampire, a belief stemming from his interpretation of what it meant to partake in the blood and flesh of Christ in order to achieve immortality. As expected, much like his mother, Marcus was a fanatic and made sure to teach his children his ways, even going as far as to handwrite his own Bible, readings of which were commonplace in the Wesson household, and of course, as most fanatics tend to be, Marcus was strict. His Bible was to be obeyed without fail, and those who didn't comply were subject to harsh physical abuse that could come at any time without any warning. To make matters even worse, Marcus wasn't just preaching to his family, but also claiming that he himself was actually a prophet, that he was able to speak to God directly, and that he knew the ultimate truth. And his family, isolated from the outside world, believed him, feared him. Marcus could do no wrong in their eyes, since his will was the will of God. Eventually, this goalpost would shift, and Marcus basically became God. Anything outside the Wesson household was demonized, portrayed as evil and corrupt. According to Marcus, the government was not to be trusted, and in later testimony, his surviving relatives would tell tales of the many times they were made to watch clips of the infamous Waco incident. Marcus oftentimes praising David Koresh for not letting the government break up his sect without a fight. 
He made it clear that if the government was so inclined to do the same thing to the Wessons, they would have to be ready. Abuse and cult-like authoritarianism weren't the only things that plagued the Wessons. Marcus, in general, was not the best at holding jobs. In fact, after his relationship with young Elizabeth officially began and his time under Rosemary's roof ended, the two relocated to Marcus's mother's home. Rather than financially supporting himself and his new wife and child, Marcus depended on his mother, who eventually kicked the couple out. After a brief stint as a bank teller, Marcus had had enough. He began depending on welfare checks, and as such, the family was more often than not suffering from extreme poverty. The sheer number of mouths to feed growing every year, worsening the situation. At some points, the children were forced to eat from dumpsters, while Marcus, on the other hand, found ways to avoid this. The family was also forced to keep moving around depending on the situation, making do wherever they could manage, at one point on board an ill-sized boat and another time on a bus. Eventually, the Wessons would find themselves within close proximity to Elizabeth's siblings, the same bunch that Marcus was actually once raising alongside Rosemary. Now they were adults with children of their own, children who were Elizabeth's nieces and nephews and Marcus's by marriage. Soon, Marcus was indoctrinating them into his personal church. They too were put under his control and eventually his guardianship. That is, until their mothers had had enough, tried to take them back, and we all know how that story ends. It should come as no surprise that Marcus soon began molesting his nieces just as he once did to Elizabeth when she was a child. According to him, this was normal, something that he had to do to teach the girls how to please a man. By the mid-1990s, Elizabeth hadn't given birth in several years for whatever reason, and Marcus began setting his sights on what he saw as the next best thing, his own daughters and nieces. Soon enough, they too would bear his children, convinced that this was the right thing to do after a lifetime of brainwashing. The story of the Wesson family is long and complicated, and there's still a lot left to be said. As mentioned earlier, Marcus had it in his head that going out like Waco was favorable to having the government take his family away, and once the authorities came knocking, this ultimately resulted in the demise of nine innocent individuals who suffered a lifetime of abuse at his hands. In 2005, Marcus was convicted of first-degree murder and sexual assault, resulting in his being sentenced to death. Given how these things go, however, Marcus, now in his 70s, is much more likely to die of old age. It goes without saying that true justice will never actually be served here, no matter what happens to Marcus. Keep in mind, there are quite a few surviving members of the Weston family, and they, at the end of the day, tragically have to live with the overwhelming amount of pain caused by this one man. While many of us use cameras solely for entertainment, there are millions out there who also use them for more practical reasons, like to help ease the stress of parenting. Baby monitors, for example, provide a helping hand in keeping an eye on the little one while you've got your hands full in another room. In some cases, however, parents can find themselves in a paradoxical mess. What happens when something made to ensure your child's safety is then used to potentially cause them harm? This was the case for the LeMay family in 2019, just a few days following the installation of a Ring security camera in the children's shared bedroom. This is what happened. Who is that? I'm your best friend! I'm Santa Claus! I'm, I'm Santa Claus! Don't you want to be my best friend? I don't know who you are. I'm Santa Claus! As you can see here, just one of the LeMay children is present. She's scared, alone, and has no idea how to deal with the strange voice that's now speaking to her via the security cam's built-in speakers. According to news reports, this harassment lasts a total of around five minutes before the little girl cries out to her mom, who's elsewhere in the house at that moment. Before things stop, however, the girl is not only taunted, but she's also encouraged to destroy her room. You can mess up your room, you can break your TV, 
can do whatever you want. The man even goes out of his way to scare the child by playing Tiny Tim's Tiptoe Through the Tulips, a song many consider scary. If you look up stories about this clip online, tons of people question the use of a camera in a children's room. As stated earlier, many parents use baby monitors in nurseries, and generally speaking, that's the societal norm, but many find it weird or even creepy that a camera was even installed here to begin with, given that the kids are a bit older. The thing is, this mother, like many, actually has a very real and valid reason for doing so. As it turns out, one of the other children not seen here suffers from a medical condition and having a camera allows for easier monitoring and documentation if something does go wrong. Other parents are also known to keep security cameras indoors to monitor their children when, let's say, they're at work and they have a babysitter present. As for the man who hacked the webcam, based on how he sounds and what he did, it's pretty easy to determine that this is just a garden variety troll, but nonetheless, it doesn't make what he did acceptable or any less harmful. We all know that this world is full of creeps, and while this one was out to make himself known, there are many out there who would have watched silently, not letting anyone in on the fact that they're being watched. By that point, who knows what could have happened. What these silent voyeurs could see you or your children doing. For all we know, the man who hacked the LeMay's security camera could have just as easily been a child predator. These days, it's easier than ever to set up a home security system, and while it's definitely not a bad idea on paper, issues begin to unearth themselves when this technology finds itself in the hands of those who just aren't tech-savvy. The people who don't fully understand how these things work, and as such, ironically, haven't set up proper safety precautions to protect the devices meant to protect them. To make matters even worse here, as we all know, it isn't just security cameras that are at risk. These days, our entire lives depend on electronic devices in general, but even if we just narrow it down to cameras, they're still everywhere. Our phones, computers, and even our TVs now come with built-in cameras, and there's no telling how many people are out to exploit this for their own gain. These technologies, of course, are extremely important in our everyday lives, be it for keeping us safe or keeping us connected, but without proper education and awareness, these tools will unfortunately continue to be exploited. It's a day just like any other at Six Flags Kentucky Kingdom. The sun is out, the weather is perfect, and most importantly, people are having a great time. Amongst the many attendees that day was a young 13-year-old girl by the name of Caitlin Lassiter and her two friends. For the trio, the day was still young. In fact, they basically just arrived at the amusement park. The first attraction they decided to ride was called Superman Tower of Power. It's a type of ride that most of us are familiar with. One that lifts riders up to nauseating heights, pauses, and then leads to a terrifying yet exhilarating freefall. Before you know it, it's all over, and while most of us will ride these without incident, the same unfortunately can't be said for young Caitlin. What happened next would change her life forever. Caitlin and her friends had just finished their first ride aboard the Tower of Power. There wasn't much of a line, so the girls were allowed a second go without even having to disembark, something that most of us would have probably decided to do ourselves if given the opportunity. For the first few seconds, things seemed to be going as usual. The passenger cars were slowly ascending as they should. Caitlin and her friends were laughing, having a great time just as they did moments earlier. But then, Things took a very sudden and terrifying turn for the worst. The girls felt a sudden jolt followed by a loud whipping sound. Before they knew it, they were covered in cables. Now, by this point, they weren't all that far off the ground. Based on different testimonies, at this point, the passenger cars were only about 30 to 40 feet off the floor. And keep in mind, this ride was over 100 feet tall. Caitlin and her friends began screaming as hard as they could, begging for the ride to be stopped, but it kept going. The girls managed to get most of the wiring off of them, but there was only so much they could do. And soon enough, they reached the summit. The ride dropped, just as it was supposed to. The girls fell, just as they did the first time, and stopped at the bottom as the machine is designed to do. Only, Caitlin, this time, was not okay. Both of her feet were completely severed by the broken cables. 
Now, to most of us, this probably sounds like a freak accident, something that happened out of nowhere that was no one's fault, but that's actually not the case. According to reports, the ride operators working that day were both under the age of 18, and whether it be due to lack of training or whatever else, they simply didn't do what they could to prevent this tragedy. In incident reports, it states that the ride operators did in fact notice the snapping noise, the broken cables, they even heard screaming that they categorized as unusual even for a thrill ride. It's important to note that this was also true of the main operator who was standing in front of the emergency brake button. For whatever reason, they decided to call the park emergency line to ask what to do instead of immediately stopping the ride. Of course, the call took up precious time. Time that was not at all to be wasted given the severity of the situation. Meanwhile, the assistant ride operator, who based on the descriptions wasn't at the control panel, yelled over to the main operator to hit the emergency brake. Which finally they did, but it was too late. The ride had begun its freefall and Caitlin would be severely injured and mentally traumatized for the rest of her life. Caitlin thankfully survived the ordeal, and her friends for the most part only experienced minor physical injuries. Both of her missing feet were recovered, and one luckily was able to be reattached. But as for the other leg, the injuries were so severe that doctors actually had to amputate below the knee. Just a year after the incident, a now 14-year-old Caitlin could be seen speaking publicly regarding the issue of safety and oversight at amusement parks. Ultimately, the official explanation for what happened was that the cable snapped due to fatigue, something that supposedly could have been detected had a newer version of the ride manual been referenced. At the end of the day, what we have here is a deadly mix of incompetence and negligence. People not doing their jobs when doing their jobs could mean the difference between life and death for innocent individuals. And while events like these aren't necessarily common, what happened to Caitlin is still horrifying and had these people cared, she absolutely would still have both of her legs today and been spared from permanent physical and mental trauma. It goes without saying that we as human beings have the right to live our lives however we see fit. We choose what we do, where we go, when we do things, and who we talk to. It's so embedded into our daily lives that most of us could barely imagine living without this freedom. That being said, we also make mistakes. Some more costly than others, and one innocent misstep could lead us down a path of no return. This unfortunately was the case for 20-year-old single mother Amber Alyssa Takaro, an indigenous woman from Alberta, Canada, whose murder to this day remains unsolved. Amber had a close relationship with her mother, Vivian, who described her as strong-willed, a tough woman who wouldn't let anyone mess with her. On the surface, everything in Amber's life seemed well and that nothing could really go wrong for her, but that all would unfortunately change in late 2010. August 17th. Amber, who lived in Fort McMurray, decides to take a weekend trip to Edmonton with her then 14-month-old son and a female friend. Instead of staying directly in Edmonton, the pair booked a stay in nearby Nisku, a much cheaper alternative. After arriving, Amber was ready to see the city, eagerly leaving the motel around 7 or 8 p.m. while her son and friend stayed behind. The trip into the city that night was presumably supposed to be brief, maybe just a couple hours of sightseeing and then back to the motel, but this unfortunately was the last time anyone would ever see Amber alive. Again, the women didn't have a ton of money at their disposal and made do with what they could for their trip. Amber, looking to save money, decided to hitchhike her way into Edmonton instead of calling a cab, a decision that at first seemed harmless but would ultimately turn grim. The young mother was picked up by a man, and what you're about to hear next is a short snippet of audio recorded while she was in his car. Where are we by? We're just heading south of uh, Beaumont, or north of Beaumont. We're heading north of Beaumont. Yo, where are we going? Just... No, this is a... Road. Are you f***ing kidding me? <laughs> you better not take... You better not take me anywhere I don't want to go. I want to go into the city. Shame. 
Yo, we're not going in the city, are we? No, we're not. Then where the f are these roads going to? Fiftieth Street. Fiftieth Street. Are you sure? Absolutely. Yo, where are we going? According to Amber's mother, she'd been in constant contact with her daughter that night and got extremely worried when she stopped responding. Amber was reported missing the next morning, but authorities had written it off as just another young person out partying and thus didn't give it too much attention. This despite the fact that she was a young woman who failed to reappear after getting into a car with a complete stranger at night. Days passed without Amber's return, and authorities still fell short, even prematurely removing Amber from the missing persons registry after just a month. Now, in case that wasn't bad enough, for some unknown reason, it took investigators four whole months before they even interviewed Amber's family, something that many consider to be due to Amber's ethnic background. Two whole years into the case, authorities finally released the audio clip you just heard in the hopes that someone would recognize the male voice and come forward. Unfortunately, however, everyone was soon going to find out what came after the abrupt ending heard at the end of the call. September 1st, 2012. Coincidentally, just four days after the call was released, two horseback riders found partial skeletal remains which would soon be ID'd as Amber. Interestingly enough, her remains were found south of her motel, which was actually in the exact opposite direction of where she wanted to go. And on top of that, they were found 17 minutes away, which is the same amount of time the full phone call lasted, prompting theories that Amber's life ended shortly after the phone call. It's pretty clear in the audio that Amber was nervous, repeating information that she was receiving, asking where they were, and even threatening the unknown man. It was at this point where Amber's situation started spiraling out of control. There wasn't anything that she could do to get herself out of the situation, given that she was in a moving vehicle in an unfamiliar area. Overall, the story is very tragic, from a heartbroken mother who lost her only daughter, a son who has to grow up without his mother, to the horrible mishandling of the situation from local authorities. To this day, Vivian Takaro still seeks justice for what happened to her daughter, and while the authorities have publicly apologized for the mishandling of the case, Vivian still wants to find whoever did this to her daughter. Countless individuals have come forward saying that they recognize the voice, but they've yet to find the man behind the murder. Vivian still believes that someone out there has to know exactly who the voice belongs to, and she hopes that one day that person will come forward and something will finally come out of it. The story you're about to hear is one that's only really mentioned in passing on the English side of the internet, a tale that most have at least heard of but can't really place. In fact, a good number of people actually mistake this for viral fiction or even a creepypasta. What I'm referring to is a case that's been dubbed the Hello Kitty murder, and yes, it really did happen. To be more precise, based on what happened in court, this might be more accurately called the Hello Kitty torture, but more on that later. First, let's discuss what happened. Hong Kong, 1999. In many ways, it's easy to see how this story could be mistaken for fiction. For one, it begins with a fairly bizarre scene. A young girl, about 13 years of age, is at a police station claiming to be haunted by an angry spirit that's been visiting her in her dreams. While at first it's unclear what the police can even do about this, the more the girl speaks, the darker things become. She told police that the ghost was that of a woman she'd not only help kill, but also torture. According to her, this wasn't for a matter of hours or even a day or two, but for an entire month. To prove her story, the girl led police to an apartment building on Granville Road, where they discovered a gruesome scene. The unit was dilapidated, giving off a gag-worthy stench, one that would be familiar to anyone who's ever been near a rotting corpse. Within sight was a large, heavily stained Hello Kitty doll, and sewn into the doll, specifically its head, was a human skull. 
While most of the skull's tissue was gone, bits of flesh and ligaments still remained, making it clear that this was relatively fresh. On top of this, other body parts were also recovered, but not as many as authorities had hoped. A bag of organs and a stray tooth had been found, but the rest of the body was never recovered. And here's why. Stéphane Magny was a married 23-year-old mother and hostess who led an unfortunately troubled life. Her early days were reportedly not easy, as she was an orphan and had to resort to making money however she could. Eventually, this would lead to her crossing paths with local gang members, one of which was a man by the name of Chan Man Lo. Fan eventually found herself in debt, as most of us do at some point in life, and to help pay this off, she allegedly stole Chan's wallet, which at the time contained several thousand dollars. The thing is, Chan, unsurprisingly, in addition to being a drug dealer and pimp, was also a loan shark. So whether Fan Mani really stole his wallet or simply took it out as a loan is unclear. Either way, it's said that Fan actually did in fact pay back the initial debt, but as these things go, Chan kept asking for more in the form of bogus interest and other nonsense to keep the already poor mother paying up. Eventually, for whatever reason, Fan stopped paying up and she stopped answering Chan's phone calls. It's now March 1999. Chan has instructed two of his underlings to forcibly take Fan from her home, and that's exactly what they did. They took her to an apartment building on Granville Road. The initial plan here was actually for Fawn to be forced into prostitution until she paid off whatever so-called debt that she still had. Chan's two henchmen resided in the apartment, and so did the 13-year-old girl, who was apparently dating one of these men, who, keep in mind, were in their 30s. The gang members wasted no time, beating Fan repeatedly on the first night of her captivity, screaming at her, asking where the money was and why she wasn't picking up her phone. For whatever reason, whether it be due to the meth the men were taking or out of sheer cruelty, the physical abuse began to escalate at an extremely alarming rate. Here are some of the things reported to the courts by the 13-year-old who was granted immunity for her testimony. According to her, the two men began to burn the woman with lighters, then rubbed chili pepper oil or other condiments into her wounds. While Fawn was held down, molten plastic was dripped onto her feet, causing severe burns and blisters, the men demanding that she either laugh or smile while this happened, lest she be subjected to more. On several occasions, Fawn was reportedly forced to consume various substances such as urine, large amounts of cooking oil, and at one point, even the 13-year-old's excrement. Wires were used to hang Fawn in an upright position, which she was kept in for hours on end, including times where she'd be struck with metal pipes, wooden sticks, or whatever else the men felt like using. It may be shocking, but this isn't even the end of it. And while there is a lot more, I think I've gotten my point across. Fawn was subjected to unspeakable cruelty, and given the severity, I think most of us aren't surprised that she ultimately passed away. Now, I do want to point out that the 13-year-old girl in question admitted, albeit with remorse, that she willingly participated in Fawn's torture and wasn't simply a spectator. It goes without saying that this guilt contributed to her turning herself in and reporting the two adult men who were also involved. At the start of the story, I mentioned a legal contention with this tale's nickname, the Hello Kitty Murder. Once this case went to court, the men responsible for Fawn's kidnapping, torture, and death were ultimately charged with manslaughter, the logic being that while their acts were heinous and unforgivable, they never intended to kill the woman, or at least there wasn't enough evidence to prove so. What exactly killed Fawn is actually unknown, this being due to the lack of a body to autopsy. After Fawn was found dead by the 13-year-old girl, the two men dismembered her in the bathtub, cooked most of her body in an attempt to mask the smell of rot, then successfully discarded most of the remains in the trash. Again, no one knows for sure if these men willingly inflicted the final blow that ultimately killed Fawn, or if she died due to her injuries, which is most likely the case, but either way, the men responsible have been put in jail and were given life sentences. Legally, this is justice, but nothing will bring Fawn back. Nothing will change the suffering she endured in her final month of life, and nothing will bring her back to her only son who has to grow up without his mother. All over a few thousand dollars.
Welcome to episode four of Stories from Our Disturbing World, the series where we take a tour of the dark side of reality. And in this episode, we take a look at five real life tales dealing in everything from one of the US's most notorious modern serial killers, all the way to a new bill that could be the next step towards total control for a budding dictatorship. As the title suggests, the content of this video is disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. The person you see here is Samantha Koenig, a young 18-year-old woman working a solo shift late into the night at this coffee stand. As we watch the footage, a few seconds go by, then we see someone approach. Samantha seems to greet them, taking their order, as she probably did with dozens earlier. Everything so far is standard. She makes the person their coffee, begins to hand it over, but then something changes. Samantha is suddenly startled, now raising her hands, which implies that whoever this customer is, they now have a gun pointed straight at her. Unfortunately, due to the angle of the cameras, we can't actually see what he's doing. But Samantha then begins turning off lights, presumably per the command of her attacker. From there, things go dark. A few minutes go by as the man keeps her at gunpoint, eventually climbing in through the window before restraining Samantha by her wrists. After a few more minutes pass, Samantha is removed from the coffee stand completely, and the footage ends with her being escorted to the parking lot, presumably to a car. This, however, is not the end of the story. Far from it, actually. By this point, Samantha was promised that she was going to be used for ransom, and that if she cooperated smoothly, she'd be returned safely. First, however, the kidnapper wanted to make sure to buy himself some time, which he did by using Samantha's phone to send out two text messages. One to Samantha's boyfriend and one to her boss, both painting a picture of a woman who had had a bad day and simply needed to leave town for a bit to calm her nerves. But this, of course, was not true at all. The kidnapper then asked for Samantha's debit card, which she didn't have on her at the time. As it turns out, she left it at home in the car she shared with her boyfriend, and instead of risking Samantha's escape, the kidnapper decided to go get the card himself while he left her tied up in a shed. Whether this was daring or just plain stupid is up for debate, but ultimately the card was retrieved, albeit with a bit of a hiccup. While the man was going through the couple's shared car, he was spotted by Samantha's boyfriend who promptly ran back inside to call for help. The kidnapper, however, slipped away soon after. Following this, things went quiet. For a whole two weeks, in fact. It was at this point that Samantha's boyfriend finally received a text letting him know his girlfriend was taken for ransom, the message also mentioning that he and the police would be able to find details at a nearby park. Once there, they found this photo. It was of Samantha, and next to her was an arm holding a newspaper used to show its date. At the back of the image was a note written using an old typewriter demanding a $30,000 deposit be placed into Samantha's account, which, keep in mind, the kidnapper now had access to. Once the money had been secured and deposited, Samantha didn't show up. Authorities had to resort to tracking the card's transactions and using security footage to hopefully get an ID, but at this point it was clear that whoever was behind this was on the run. Withdrawals could be seen in Arizona, New Mexico, and eventually Texas, where seemingly by luck, a highway patrol officer managed to spot a car that fit the description. Both Samantha's card and cell phone were found within the car, and the man responsible for Samantha's disappearance was finally arrested. This, however, is still not the end of the story. We've just barely scratched the surface. What police had on their hands was much, much more than a first-time kidnapper. The man who took Samantha was identified as 34-year-old Israel Keys, and once he was sent back to Alaska, he confessed to Samantha's murder. As it turns out, the promise he made to the girl was a complete lie. He never intended to return her to her family. In fact, here's his account of what actually happened. 
According to Keyes, Samantha was actually sexually assaulted and killed on the day of her kidnapping, which means that in this photo, the one promising her safe return for $30,000, Samantha was actually already dead. According to Keyes, after he killed her, he stored her body for two weeks while he left for New Orleans to take a cruise, and upon his return, he propped up the body and used a fishing line to sew Samantha's eyes open in an attempt to sell the idea that she was still alive. After the photo was taken, the girl's body was dismembered and disposed of in a frozen lake. The question at this point would be why, but the thing is, the answer isn't as simple as one might hope. While in custody, Israel Keyes would shock authorities by admitting to several more murders that were carried out over several states, possibly dating all the way back to the mid-90s. He had no preferred type of victim and made sure not to kill in the same area twice. One of the most notable claims that Keyes made was in regards to his tendency to plan things way ahead of time. He was known to plant so-called kill caches around different states, ones like what you see here. In this case, a bucket filled with zip ties, ammunition, and even a handgun. It should be noted that while a few of these have been found in different states, investigations are still ongoing, so if anyone was to uncover one of these, they're instructed not to touch anything and to immediately alert the FBI. At this point, you may be wondering why authorities don't use keys for more information, but that's because he's no longer alive. In December of 2012, the same year of the kidnapping and murder, Keyes would end his own life, taking the details of his other crimes with him to the grave. Ever since then, the FBI has been trying to confirm this man's link to murders all over the country. At this point, the official number of victims is believed to be 11. And just a few weeks ago, investigators revealed this. These were drawn by Keyes and found under his bed following his death. Eleven skulls and one pentagram, drawn in his own blood. One skull bears the words, we are one. What it all means, right now, we can't be sure. Overall, the Israel Keys case is mind-boggling, and there's a lot here I didn't cover about the wider investigation. I do implore you to look more into this for yourself, as authorities have posted his travel logs online and are asking anyone with tips or relevant information to contact the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI or fbi.gov. This is Lavina Johnson a 19-year-old U.S. Army Private First Class who was deployed in Iraq. Her life ended in July of 2005 via a self-inflicted gunshot wound, or at least that's what the U.S. military would like you to believe. Lavina's father, Dr. John H. Johnson, believes two things. One, that his daughter was actually murdered, and two, that the U.S. Army covered it up. Lavina Johnson, by all accounts, had a bright future ahead of her. The Missouri native was not only musically talented, but also stood firmly at the top of her class all the way to her high school graduation in 2004. Lavina was determined and knew exactly what she wanted for herself in life, which was to attend college and to one day become a film producer. According to her family, Lavina always kept others in mind, and knowing that she had siblings her parents needed to support, opted to join the U.S. Army. It was a win-win situation in her eyes. Not only would she be finding a way to pay for college without straining her family, but she would also be following in her father's footsteps as Dr. Johnson actually served in the army himself in his younger days. By May of 2005, Lavina was deployed to Iraq, and while her family was naturally cautious, all seemed to be going well save for a few hiccups, and they made sure to keep in touch as much as possible. This constant communication between Lavina and her family made it all the more shocking for her parents when in July of that year, just two months after Lavina's deployment, they received a knock on their door from a soldier, something the military family knew was bad news. According to Dr. Johnson, the soldier tasked with alerting the family of Lavina's passing was vague and didn't really say exactly what happened, only that their daughter had taken her own life. 
Once the army's official investigation into Lavina's death wrapped up, they'd officially concluded that her death was indeed a suicide. According to them, the young soldier was depressed, and her body was even found next to her M16 rifle in a contractor's tent, something that drew suspicion from Dr. Johnson, who again was a veteran himself. He was unconvinced that his barely past five foot tall daughter could physically manage to shoot herself in the head with such a sizable weapon. What the army was telling Dr. Johnson was ultimately irrelevant. He had to see the evidence for himself, something that he had to get help of Congress in order to achieve, and once he did, he was horrified. Crime scene photos show Lavina on her back, fully clothed in PT gear with her right arm resting over her face. To her left is a standard issue cot, and just beyond that is her rifle. Already, this begs the question of how Lavina managed to shoot herself with a weapon that was found beyond her reach. The army claimed that this was because a medic had removed the rifle in order to perform CPR upon discovery of her body. Why the medic supposedly went all the way around the cot to place it down is unclear. The Johnson family, upon receiving the stockpile of evidence from the U.S. Army, assembled their own investigation team primarily made up of family members who had professional experience in the criminal science field. And for them, the bizarre state in which Lavina's body was photographed was just the tip of the iceberg. In a 2009 letter to Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, Dr. Johnson outlined several troubling facts. For example, the bullet wound found on Lavina's head not only didn't match the type of weapon found on the scene, but on top of that, the angle of the wound didn't match official reports at all, and the bullet itself was never found. The U.S. Army claimed that Lavina had aimed the M16 in her mouth, but for some reason her nose was visibly broken, her teeth were knocked in, things that shouldn't in theory happen based on how Lavina supposedly ended her life. To add to all of this, Lavina, despite being found fully clothed, had signs of genital trauma, which appeared to be caused by acid. Since the case was ruled a suicide from the start, no DNA testing was done to help rule out sexual assault. The letter also outlines more evidence pointing to a possible cover-up, including a, quote, pool of smeared blood with large footprints in it both found inside the tent and yards from the body. Blood was also reportedly found outside of the tent. Other bits of evidence are just downright bizarre. For example, the Johnsons apparently received Lavina's body in uniform, which would have been normal if not for the fact that her gloves were glued to her hands. On the surface, this is already perplexing, but most who hear this assume that since it isn't standard practice in mortuaries, that it must have been done to hopefully deter anyone from swabbing Lavina's fingernails for DNA. In the end, Lavina's case ultimately led to a dead end. The army still maintains its stance on this being a suicide, but anyone who's heard the story tends to think otherwise. In many ways here, it isn't just Lavina's death that was tragic, but what's equally disturbing is the U.S. Army's perceived reluctance to look deeper into this, their lack of empathy or compassion for the family of one of their own who had fallen. Whether this is the result of a cover-up or just lack of caring is legally unclear, but in the end, it seems safe to say that the U.S. Army did not do enough to investigate the Johnsons' concerns. Calls to reopen the case have come and gone, but ultimately there has been no justice for PFC Lavina Johnson or her family. To many of us, the idea of going cave exploring rides the line between interesting and absolutely terrifying. While curiosity nags at us to do it, we also tend to get uneasy over the idea of somehow getting trapped or worse. A great many enjoy this as a hobby and go about it without incident, but this next story unfortunately does not have a happy ending. John Edward Jones was just 26 years old when he would enter Utah's Nutty Putty Cave for the first time. He wasn't alone, however. The expedition took place just a few days before Thanksgiving of 2009, and was the Jones family's idea of some much-needed family bonding. In fact, it was a long-time hobby for them, and something they were quite comfortable with. Everything seemed to be coming along great in John's life. He was a medical student and a new father, and he and his wife were even expecting a second child who John ultimately would never meet. 
John was starting his new life in Virginia, where he went to school, and as such, it'd been a while since he went cave exploring. Since family and friends were present, it seemed like a low-risk situation, and at approximately 8pm, they entered. John and a couple others decided to leave the open chambers in search of a narrow passageway known as the Birth Canal. Now, to most of us, what John was in search of is already scary enough, but what he ended up finding on accident was much, much worse and ultimately fatal. John came upon a narrow opening. It seemed like the same one that he was looking for, but after crawling on his stomach for a few minutes, it became evident that he had made a mistake. There was no way for him to turn around, and the channel was too narrow for him to crawl backwards. He had no choice but to press on. Eventually, John came upon an area that seemed to be his ticket out. It was a narrow drop, one that was almost straight down. Risky, but perhaps it would give him enough space to turn back the way he came. As he descended headfirst, it became apparent that John made a grave miscalculation once again. As he slid himself into the vertical passage, he got stuck, and upon trying to struggle his way loose, he only fell deeper into the hole. At this point, John was basically completely upside down and completely unable to move. Approximately three hours after John had become stuck, rescue teams finally arrived. Keep in mind, by this point it was past midnight, and John was deep into the cave, specifically about 400 feet in and 100 feet underground. Needless to say, rescue was going to be extremely difficult, and to make matters even worse, time was of the essence. Since John was upside down, his blood flow would be inhibited. According to John's brother Josh, at first he thought this rescue was going to go by without a hitch. Again, the family was pretty well versed in the hobby and had gotten stuck in a few different caves before. But once Josh saw exactly how his brother was wedged, he began to grow weary. The idea was to use a series of pulleys in order to free John, but even an entire rescue team with the appropriate gear couldn't do much to help him given the angle he was in. Other means were also considered, from oil all the way to explosives, but nothing worked. Another major issue stemming from the position John was in was the fact that it meant that manpower only made things worse. The issue here wasn't that there weren't enough people to pull John out, but that his legs were set in such a way that freeing him would mean breaking his legs. After over 27 grueling hours trying to free John, he stopped responding and was pronounced dead. After this incident, it was determined that the cave was too dangerous and had to be permanently sealed. Given the circumstances, John's body ultimately couldn't be recovered, and to this day, his body remains in the very place where he lost his life. This rather startling image is a police sketch of an infamous Australian serial pedophilic rapist known as Mr. Cruel. Active between 1987 and 1990 with three confirmed cases, this man is also the prime suspect behind an abduction and murder. All four of these incidents took place within the state of Victoria. August 22nd, 1987. A man breaks into a family home at 4 a.m. The assailant goes on to tie up the parents of the household, leaving them in a closet. He ties their son to a bed, before cutting the phone lines. He then proceeds to sexually assault their 11-year-old daughter, while managing to leave behind no physical evidence. Once word of this gets out, the media officially dubs him Mr. Cruel due to the unspeakably cruel nature of his crimes. December 27th, 1988. A chillingly similar scene begins to unfold. Mr. Cruel would strike another unsuspecting family at approximately 5.30 a.m. This time, he was armed with both a knife and a gun. Just like last time, the parents were bound, but now money was also being demanded. It's unclear if the parents paid up, but nonetheless, the masked man then went after the family's 10-year-old daughter. She was abducted, missing for 18 whole hours before being dumped at a nearby school, wearing nothing but plastic bags. Again, no substantial evidence was uncovered. July 3rd, 1990. 
Once again, armed with a knife and handgun, Mr. Cruel breaks into a home through a window. It's nearly midnight when a 13-year-old resident of the home is tied up and just like the last case, abducted. According to reports, the girl was taken to a home, assaulted for nearly two days, then released in a public space. April 13th, 1991. A masked intruder, believed to be Mr. Cruel, breaks into the home of three female children. Two are tied up, while the third, a 13-year-old, is abducted. Only this time, she'd never be seen alive again. A year later, a body was found and eventually linked to the girl who'd been shot three times in the head. It should be noted that this case can't officially be linked to Mr. Cruel, however, it's highly suspected that this was his doing, especially given the fact that this victim had attended the same school as the girl kidnapped in the previous case. While these crimes did span three to four years, they definitely did not go unnoticed by both authorities and the public. The victims in these cases were able to provide an astonishing amount of information to police. One, for example, was able to count the amount of turns taken by the car she was in as she was being abducted. Another mentioned hearing planes fly overhead while at this man's assumed home, something leading to the natural assumption that he was located within close proximity to an airport. Despite all of this information, however, Mr. Cruel was able to cover his tracks. He was meticulous, making sure to bathe the girls he assaulted, and when he made plans, he stuck to them. In the case of the girl who'd been held for two days, she was told by Mr. Cruel that she was going to be released within 50 hours, and she was. The girl who was found only wearing plastic bags was believed to have been left like that, so police couldn't use her clothes as evidence. In other cases, he took clothes from the girl's home to make sure that he could dispose of what they were wearing when they were taken. Because of all these factors, along with several others, the initial investigations would ultimately lead to a dead end. This even after dozens of nearby sex offenders were questioned. In 2010, local authorities would revisit the case. Overall, they claim a mass of 27,000 people had been interviewed, an undertaking that ultimately amounted to a $4 million cost, and yet the man was never apprehended, even to this day. It goes without saying that there's a very good chance that Mr. Cruel is still alive as we speak. In fact, he suspected of being the culprit behind a ton of other child-involved cases. According to authorities, it's suspected that Mr. Cruel recorded his assaults and could be involved in the child porn trade, at this point maybe even doing so online. With that said, it's a long shot, but if you think you have any relevant information, contact the Victoria Police at crimestoppers.com.au. The Philippines is a country that, for the most part, isn't heavily discussed in the West. Most know it exists, but probably can't say much in regards to its culture, history, and politics. It's a country with a troubled and complicated past, from Spanish and American rule all the way to a 20-year dictatorship. The country is no stranger to tragedy, and unfortunately, that sentiment still rings true to this very day. Just several weeks ago, in the final days of May 2020, Filipino Twitter users began sounding the alarms on a new but familiar issue. Hashtag Junk Terror Bill was trending at number one, with many users expressing their fear, anger, and disgust over the matter. Now, you've probably never heard of this, so what exactly does this hashtag refer to, and why were so many people up in arms about it, even scared because of it? Hashtag Junk Terror Bill refers to SB 1083, also known as the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020, which passed just before the uproar online started. As for what this type of bill would be used for, the Philippines has had a long-running history of issues with terrorist organizations such as the Abu Sayyaf, but many believe that this bill isn't actually made for people like them. 
Page 3 of the bill discusses human rights, which are described as absolute and to be protected at all times. There's even a section saying that while acts of terror are illegal, they're not synonymous with advocacy, protests, dissent, etc. This all sounds well and normal, but issues begin to unearth themselves once you keep reading. For example, page 10 states that you can be charged with inciting terrorism, quote, without taking any direct part in the commission of terrorism. Means of inciting terrorism, according to the bill, include speeches, proclamations, writings, emblems, banners, or other representations. The penalty for such a crime is 12 years in jail. In section 5 of the bill, it explains that anyone who threatens to commit terrorism will be held legally accountable, but at no point does it actually define threatening. This, again, something that is not defined, will also get you over a decade of jail time. The bill controversially also adds implementations that allow law enforcement to spy on suspected terrorists and arrest slash detain them without warrants. There's a lot more to this, but these are the main points most people online have a problem with, and to many of us this all may sound like one giant moral panic over a new bill that sounds scary but is probably harmless. But many in the Philippines see the writing on the wall and consider this to not just be an anti-free speech bill, but a step forward in the removal and even imprisonment of anyone who criticizes the government. Again, the Philippines is no stranger to dictatorship, martial law, and militant government oppression. And with the 2016 victory of President Rodrigo Duterte, things have only gotten worse. Overseas, this man is best known for his war on drugs, complete with overt threats to his own citizens and a shocking wave of killings without due process from both police and supposed vigilantes. Overall, the official number of citizens killed after being accused of being drug users or dealers is just over 5,000, but some sources from within the country claim that number could actually be as much as four times higher. Dozens of these victims have even been children. The president, meanwhile, remains completely unapologetic, at one point calling himself the Hitler of the Philippines while on the podium, infamously telling his people that he is, quote, happy to slaughter drug users. Needless to say, Duterte is an extremely polarizing figure. Some use the Donald Trump comparison to help those overseas form an understanding of just how divided the country is in their opinion of the man. To many, he's already seen as a ruthless dictator, and to others, he's the strong man head of state needed to whip the country into shape. At the end of the day, however, the point is that the man is heavily criticized, both by citizens and political opponents, and to many, this bill is just another step towards total control, a tool put in place to silence anyone, including regular citizens on social media, who oppose him and his rule. With this in place, anyone who, for example, says that his slaughtering of drug addicts is wrong can be and will likely be deemed a terrorist and thrown in jail for 12 years, maybe even more. In case you still believe this is an overreaction, consider this. The Philippines has a massive, and I mean massive, problem with something called red tagging, which is basically when you deem someone you dislike a terrorist or communist regardless of their actual affiliations, hence the red part of red tag. One of the most notable incidents would happen in March of 2018, when the Duterte administration released a list of over 600 names of people they deemed terrorists. A standout being a United Nations Special Rapporteur, which, in case you're unaware, is a position charged with fact-checking and investigating human rights violations within the country they're assigned to. Which brings us to our next point. President Duterte has had a turbulent relationship with human rights activists and journalists in the Philippines since he took office. This New York Times article centers on Filipino journalist Maria Ressa, who runs a local news organization critical of Duterte's war on drugs, killings, and the government's laundry list of human rights violations. In 2019, she was named by the Manila Times as just another cog in a massive conspiracy to destroy the government with fake news and anti-Duterte propaganda. This again for reporting on what the rest of the world sees for what it is. In 2018, the International Federation of Journalists released a report on the state of journalistic freedom in the region of Southeast Asia, and the Philippines came in dead last. Those who report on stories that cast Duterte in a negative light are not only subject to his wrath, but also the wrath of his fanatic supporters who, in many cases, are willing to kill on his behalf. 
In fact, according to IFJ's report, by 2018, just two years into Duterte's rule, 12 journalists had lost their lives. As for those fighting for rights on other fronts, it's the same unfortunate, violent story. According to Global Witness, in 2016, 28 environmental activists were killed. In 2018, 41 were lost. Frontline Defenders, an Irish-based human rights organization, has had a particularly grisly history in the Philippines. Its local, non-violent advocates, known as Human Rights Defenders, have been killed basically en masse, with 474 murdered during the Arroyo Presidency, 139 murdered during the Aquino Presidency, and 91 killed after the first two years of Duterte's appointment to office. That's over 700 dead in just under two decades. Decades. And keep in mind, these are just numbers from one organization. Just recently even, on May 28th of this year, a man by the name of Carlito Badion, an advocate for those suffering from poverty in Ormoc City, Leyte, was found dead. His body burnt and, according to reports, showing signs that suggested torture. In a statement following Carlito's death, those within his advocacy organization claimed that the man had recently been red-tagged, and that he was killed by members of the armed forces. They went on to say that he did nothing but good in his life, devoting it to those in need. They, of course, also condemned the actions of his killers, along with what they described as a brutal administration. Perhaps the scariest thing about all of this is the fact that the Philippine government, despite how upfront it can be about its intentions, rarely ever takes any responsibility for these killings. You hear the same story time and time again. A crying mother will mourn the death of her son, who was suddenly rushed by men with guns, who shot him dead and then left. This is also what happened to a lot of the 700 murdered frontline defenders. Someone shows up, shoots, then bails. If it weren't for their connections and political leanings, all of this would almost seem like random acts of violence. But they're not. Be it the work of corrupt police, soldiers, or armed vigilantes killing in the name of the president, the Philippines has a lot of demons to sort out and a lot of people are terrified right now. Since the new anti-terror bill has passed, a lot of Filipinos are left wondering if this is finally the moment where Duterte flips the switch and enacts total control. Suddenly, even those who aren't activists or journalists are scared. Scared for their lives, even. Still, many are speaking out, insisting that activism and wanting things to get better isn't and should not be deemed as terrorism, especially by a government that kills thousands of its own people. The future for the country is definitely uncertain, and as things stand right now, things are only getting worse. It's difficult to say what can even be done about it. I'm going to speak personally for a second, say that when I was growing up in the Philippines in the early 2000s, things definitely weren't perfect, but I'd hoped for a long time that somewhere down the road things would get better, and to be honest, that dream has kind of been shattered. Having said that though, the country is extremely resilient and has made its way out of dictatorships before, one can only hope that this time around, things will start to improve sooner than later. Welcome to episode 5 of Stories from Our Disturbing World, the series where we take a tour of the dark side of reality. And in this episode, we take a look at five real-life tales dealing in everything from a Twitter loophole that allows for child exploitation, all the way to an attempted murder gone viral for all the wrong reasons. As the title suggests, the content of this video is disturbing. Your discretion is advised. At the start of this year, a new but disturbingly familiar issue came to light amongst Twitter users in the form of hashtag megalinks. On the surface, this hashtag probably sounds a bit esoteric. You hear it, but aren't sure exactly what it's about. Regardless, it sounds like it's harmless, something that you might not think twice about. If back then, however, you decided to explore it, you may have just ended up traumatized. What you would find is a lot of not safe for work content being networked via the hashtag, and in and of itself, this doesn't seem all that bad until you take a closer look. You'll start to see other tags like teens, jailbait, young boys slash girls, and even just straight up requests for child pornography. While the hashtag currently seems to have mostly cleared up due to mass reporting and heightened awareness of the issue, every so often you'll still see someone there who claims to be either selling or on the market for child porn. 
This is obviously a lot to unpack, so let's start at the beginning. What exactly is hashtag megalinks? While the links part is self-explanatory, Mega actually refers to a file sharing site called Mega.nz. Now, in case that sounds familiar, you might have heard of its predecessor, Mega Upload, a site that in 2013 was actually seized by the US Department of Justice and ultimately shut down for piracy. By 2014, Mega had taken its place, and what makes Mega stand out as far as cloud storage goes is its encryption. Alice and Bob are lawyers and need to store and exchange highly confidential documents with their clients. Bob simply uploads them to the cloud storage that he has always used. Unfortunately, they are stored without proper encryption, so Bob and his clients have to rely on the security assurances made by that company. Alice is smart. Alice uses Mega, which encrypts all data before it is sent, with cryptographic keys that only she controls. Nobody else, not even Mega, has access to them. Because all Mega client products are open source and subject to inspection by security researchers, Alice does not have to take Mega's word for the security of her crucial information. Only parties of Alice's choosing receive the keys required to decrypt the files that she shares with them. For the less tech savvy out there, the whole point is that Mega itself does not have access to the files they host, meaning for all intents and purposes, what's stored there is truly private. As the video suggests, this actually does have practical and completely legal applications, especially in the current era. But the problem here is that if, say, a client were to upload illegal content, not even Mega itself could turn it into the authorities since they simply don't have the keys to it. Now, it is important to note that Mega is far from the only site that offers client-side encryption, and beyond that, cloud storage is only one half of the equation. These pedophiles wouldn't have a way to find each other in the first place without some kind of networking tool, in this case, Twitter. Without a doubt, Twitter is one of the biggest social media sites out there, so how is this stuff allowed to exist? Twitter has an entire page dedicated to its policies relating to child exploitation, and at first, they all seem good. Twitter has zero tolerance towards any material that features or promotes child sexual exploitation, one of the most serious violations of the Twitter rules. This may include media, text, illustrated, or computer-generated images. Regardless of the intent, viewing, sharing, or linking to child exploitation material contributes to the re-victimization of the depicted children. So below this are actually bullet points that expand on the matter, stating that things like sharing fantasies about about minors or expressing a desire to obtain child exploitative material are intolerable offenses. And again, users really began sounding the alarms on this issue at the beginning of this year, and as such have mass-reported pedophile accounts associated with hashtag megalinks. For the most part, this seems to have greatly reduced the problem, but not really. And here's why. Even with the hashtag under fire, pedophiles and child predators are a massive problem for Twitter in general. Now, given all the seemingly great policies I just discussed, how is that still allowed to exist? Well, a March 2019 policy update actually allowed for a massive loophole. I'm sure you've heard of maps or minor attracted persons, which is what a lot of self-admitted pedophiles have chosen to call themselves online and amongst their own community. Note the language there, minor attracted person. Now, let's look a little deeper at Twitter's child exploitation policy. Like I said earlier, it starts off well with stuff about how such material or postings are absolutely not tolerated. But once you get into the what is not in violation of this policy part, you get this. Discussions related to child sexual exploitation as a phenomenon or attraction towards minors are permitted, provided that they don't promote or glorify child exploitation in any way. So this of course begs the question, how exactly does one express attraction to minors without glorifying child exploitation? In the strictest sense, attraction and action aren't technically the same thing, but when we're talking about the nuances of online communities and really the internet in general, this policy really amounts to leaving a door open for predators to get away with normalizing sexual abuse. Even worse, this could also protect predators who are using Twitter to contact minors directly. In theory, a grown adult could tweet a 12-year-old about how, quote, hot they are or something, and that would be perfectly acceptable under Twitter's policy. 
Hashtag Megalinks isn't the first networking tool to be used by child predators, and unfortunately, it isn't and won't be the last. According to an article by Rappler.com from May of 2020, child pornography was once again being marketed and sold on Twitter using a completely different set of hashtags, this time selling for as low as 100 Philippine pesos, or roughly 2 US dollars. The piece opens with a disturbing scene tweeted out by a peddler of child porn. A boy stares into the camera. The phone's yellow flash illuminates his face, highlighting features that suggest he is barely in his teens. He is in a dark room, sitting on what looks like a plastic bench. The camera points downward, revealing that the boy is naked from the waist down. At the 20 second mark, a hand moves into frame and starts touching the boy's private parts. The video cuts abruptly. A sneak peek is up. To watch the entire video, according to the tweet, you'd have to pay 300 Philippine pesos or just six US dollars. This is obviously just one disturbing example amongst a seemingly never-ending sea of child exploitation material that exists online. The lesson maybe to take away here is that child pornography isn't confined to the deep web like many of us would like to believe. It's not exclusively distributed by clandestine pedophile rings either because it doesn't always need to be. With sites like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, Google Drive, Dropbox, etc. I could keep going on, it's easier than ever for pedophiles to have decentralized communities where they pop up and disappear before anyone can even blink. Of course, most people who come across these things online report it and try their best to get the operation shut down, but even then, the efforts seem to be futile. Get an account reported and banned and another will simply spring up in its place. It's hard to say what the best solution here is, but one thing that's for sure is that tech companies really haven't done enough to try to mitigate the issue. The question that many people have now is how much more it'll really take until they finally, finally budge. If you were paying attention at all in June of this year, then you probably heard about the viral TikTok video where a group of Seattle teenagers find a body in a suitcase, but chances are you actually haven't heard about the subsequent investigation or the arrest that was made in connection to the murders. We'll get to that, but let's start at the very beginning for anyone unaware of the situation. On June 19th, 2020, a young TikTok user and their friends were having a bit of fun using the help of Randonautica, an app that generates a random set of coordinates which users then head to for the sake of exploration. In this particular case, the app sent the teens over to 1150 Alki Avenue Southwest, which happened to be just off the coast. Once there, the group happened upon a black suitcase lying upon a cluster of rocks. Like anyone would, they decided to see if anything was in it. This is what happened next. Guys, we found a, a suitcase at the beach. Gabby, go. I'll hold your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Bro. <laughs> Wait, open it. <laughs> open it. <laughs> it stinks, y'all. It washed up. It's oh. <gasps> oh. Okay, so she made. Okay, so she's calling the police so we can see if it's actually a dead body or it's just food. <laughs> First, we want to begin with some breaking news. Seattle police are investigating after several bags filled with human remains were found near the water on Alki Avenue this afternoon. I want to show you a look here at what's happening there. Police say they have they had received a call about a suspicious bag. They found more once arriving on the scene. You can see police out there right now. Harbor Patrol also helping out and the King County Medical Examiner's Office has been called in. For most people, this is where the story ends, their attention quickly shifting towards a then newly emerging wave of clickbait, creepy Randonautica content. The actual case, however, quickly faded into obscurity, but this is the rest of the story. 
Following the discovery of these suitcases, King County medical examiners identified the remains as that of 35-year-old Jessica Lewis and 27-year-old Austin Wenner, a couple who had been together for nearly a decade. But how exactly did they end up dismembered and left at sea? Right now, this is still an active case, but local authorities are pretty certain they have their guy. In all, the investigation lasted exactly two months. The bodies of Jessica and Austin, if you recall, were found on June 19th. On August 19th, a warrant was served to search the property of one Michael Lee Dudley, age 62. Now, who exactly is this guy, and why are authorities so certain that he's the culprit? WestsideSeattle.com actually obtained a copy of Seattle PD's probable cause report, and the details outlined in it are damning. According to the report, Michael Lee Dudley actually lived with the victims, or rather, they lived with him as tenants. Police were able to obtain the couple's cell phone records, and they indicated that Jessica and Austin's phones stopped transmitting data on June 9th at approximately 7 p.m., 10 whole days before their bodies would eventually be discovered. The report goes on to say that one of the last people contacted by the couple before their phones went out was none other than their landlord. This is already bad enough, but we're only at the tip of the iceberg here. According to witnesses, Dudley didn't get along very well with the couple, and they seemed to frequently clash over instances of unpaid rent and other vague issues, such as Dudley's insistence that the couple would somehow bring crime into his home. Once detectives were able to search the residence, they found everything from bullet holes to blood in the couple's room, dubbed the Blue Room in the report. To make matters even worse, surrounding neighbors were interviewed as well, and according to them, they'd actually called the police on the Dudley residence on the night of June 9th after hearing both gunfire and a young man screaming, Please don't do this, just let me leave. According to records, police did respond to the call, but ultimately left when no one answered the door. A female witness later told police that she'd visited the residence later that same evening, and that the so-called blue room contained what she described as a pile of clothes on the floor, of which a, quote, bloody arm was visibly protruding from. Dudley then asked her to leave, claiming that he had to, quote, clean up his mess, and when asked about it later, he told the witness, quote, that his gun had worked and that his didn't. Although Dudley didn't specify who he was, it's quite obvious that he was referring to Austin. Following the search, Dudley was put into custody, where he admitted to police that he and the couple had been staying together during quarantine, and that it was just the three of them. On top of this, he also admitted to owning a gun, that the blue room was where Jessica and Austin lived, and that he and the couple didn't get along. His explanation for the blood found in the blue room was that Jessica had, quote, cut herself. But as for the bullet holes and rounds that were recovered, well, he supposedly could not explain those. The report closes, noting that it was obvious that the room had just been painted and cleaned fairly recently, just another point of suspicion in a pile of mounting evidence. It's important to note that Michael Dudley has technically not been convicted yet, but things definitely don't look good at this point, and despite all the evidence I just outlined, he still decided to plead not guilty. Jessica's aunt has come forward to speak publicly about the loss of her niece, and according to her, she just wants people to recognize that inside those bags and beyond the viral videos were real people. She describes Jessica as having been beautiful and a ray of sunshine, who was also a mother of four. Austin is described by his family as having faith, a big heart, and having loved the outdoors, Jessica, and his entire family. On October 22nd of 2018, this disturbing video was uploaded to Chinese social media and quickly went viral.
Now, that may have been a bit confusing, so allow me to clarify. You probably noticed that the video, obviously shot at night, shows the exterior of some kind of building. According to the user who uploaded it, what you're looking at is Lin Yi Mental Hospital, located in eastern China. It goes without saying that whatever's happening inside is putting someone under an extreme amount of distress, and even worse, that person sounds a lot like a child. His screams alone would be enough for this video to grab the attention of the masses, but what really made this clip blow up has to do with the aforementioned hospital. The thing is, this isn't just any mental hospital. The uploader claimed that the screams seemed to specifically be coming from somewhere he called Room 13, a place they themselves claimed to be a past victim of. All of this was reported in an article by the South China Morning Post a couple days later, and in it, Linny Mental Hospital denies the existence of Room 13, and also insists that all of its procedures are perfectly safe. If this is to be believed, then what was the deal with that video? And why did so many people latch onto it? One might assume it was due to quick outrage or a belief in conspiracy theories, but that's actually not what's going on here. Screams aren't exactly unheard of when it comes to mental health facilities, but Chinese onlookers had a very real and valid reason to be concerned nonetheless. The tale of Room 13 begins in 2006 with a doctor by the name of Yang Yongjin, a practicing clinical psychiatrist at Lin Yi Mental Hospital. By this point in time, the concept of gaming and or internet addiction became a concern for unfamiliar parents pretty much all across the globe. But in China, the government went one step further, controversially labeling, quote, internet addiction disorder a mental illness. As such, panicked parents began sending their children to boot camp style treatment centers that are now infamous for their harsh conditions and corporal punishment. Dr. Yan Yongjin is known to many as being one of the worst offenders due to his attempts to treat so-called internet addiction with electroconvulsive therapy, popularly known as electroshock therapy. Room 13 was actually the name given to Dr. Yang's treatment room. Now, before we move forward, I do want to point out that many in the modern age do find electroconvulsive therapy to be beneficial. While still a last resort, it's not exactly what most people picture. According to Scientific American, the patient is consenting and placed under both anesthesia and muscle relaxers to both eliminate pain and reduce risk of injury. Depictions of electroconvulsive therapy used as a means of punishment are often based on conditions synonymous with mental health in decades past, such as the 1950s, for example. Now, Room 13, as you might have guessed, was definitely stuck in the past and featured a long list of ethical issues. First off, the bootcamp style environment and arbitrary admission requirements were already distressing enough. But on top of that, the children and minors placed under Dr. Yang's care weren't consenting at all and often terrorized into conformity. As for the actual treatment itself, it was as inhumane as you could imagine. Again, in modern practice, the patient is placed under anesthesia, but Dr. Yang was known to skip that entirely, leaving his young patients to feel every second of his so-called treatment. As it turns out, this type of treatment, even when done properly and humanely, is basically never used on younger patients and again is seen as a complete last resort, not something that you administer at the drop of a hat. According to Dr. Yang, however, his treatment for internet addiction had almost a 100% success rate, and at first he was hailed by the Chinese media as a hero. In 2009, China Central Television, a state-run network, released a short documentary about his practice in which Dr. Yang was praised, and the internet, particularly online gaming, was demonized. This broadcast turned heads and naturally got people talking, but not for the reasons China Central Television had hoped. Instead of agreeing with Dr. Yang's methods, many former patients, victims really, began to speak up, igniting widespread outrage across the Chinese internet. In a strange turn of events, the Chinese government responded to the criticism not by silencing people, but with an outright ban on electroconvulsive therapy as a means to treat internet addiction. And from that point forward, Room 13 and the entire program were technically disbanded. 
or so people thought. Even following the 2009 ban, Dr. Yang did not stop. Instead, he insisted that he could continue to treat young patients with a low-frequency electronic treatment that he swore was different from what he was doing in the past. Despite this, though, critics of Dr. Yang knew what was actually happening, and in their minds, nothing had changed at all. The video mentioned at the beginning of this segment to them was the closest thing to proof they could get, but even without it, victims who leave Dr. Yang Yongjin's grasp know exactly what's happening. As things stand now, the old Room 13 may not exist anymore, but even so, a new one has definitely taken its place, and it seems like nothing is going to stop it. On December 10th of 1979, 33-year-old John Mercure passed away from what appeared to be an overdose. His mother, Marion Gonzalez, enlisted the help of Sacramento's Memorial Lawn Mortuary to help lay John to rest. Back in August of that year, Memorial Lawn Mortuary took on a new apprentice embalmer, a 21-year-old woman by the name of Karen Greenlee. The subject of this segment and the person who would go on to traumatize John's entire family for her own satisfaction. By December 17th, John was to be laid to rest. A private burial was scheduled for approximately 10 a.m., but if things did go as planned, we wouldn't be talking about this right now. 10 a.m. came and left, but by that point, nothing about the situation was normal. John, or rather his body, was missing, which in itself was already strange enough, but to top this all off, so was his casket, the company hearse, and one Karen Greenlee. For the next 24 hours, authorities searched for Greenlee and, by extension, the missing corpse and vehicle. Once they were all found, however, things only got more unusual. The hearse was spotted over an hour and a half away from Sacramento in a heavily wooded area. Inside was an overdose but still alive Karen Greenlee, the corpse of John Mercure, and a letter. One that explained the bizarre string of events that had just taken place. According to the letter, Karen was actually a necrophiliac. She'd taken an interest in John despite him not being alive, but it doesn't end there. In the four and a half page letter, the woman also admitted to using her position at the mortuary to have sex with the corpses of up to 40 men, a practice she would later expand upon five years later in an interview with Jim Morton for his book Apocalypse Culture. As noted in the book, Karen's initial confession letter was full of regret. She called her necrophilia an addiction and pondered over what exactly drove her to do such things. By the time of the interview, however, Karen was a changed woman, no longer ashamed, and what she said would go on to become infamous. In excruciating detail, Karen explains her attraction to corpses, noting that everything from the cold to the smell had an erotic effect on her. Blood purging from a corpse was wasn't a problem to her either. In fact, she actually enjoyed it. As the interview goes on, Karen explains that after the incident in Sacramento, she'd gotten a job at a new funeral home, one that she had the keys to and would often, quote, slip back into after hours and spend all night at. When she didn't have access to a corpse via a job, Karen found other ways to satisfy her urges, including routinely breaking into another nearby mortuary until a close call in which she was almost caught. Now, as if things couldn't get any weirder, Karen also admits to attending the funerals of the people whose bodies she'd used for sexual gratification. Right now, you're probably picturing her either standing at a distance or maybe even being in attendance as a staff member. But in actuality, Karen, for whatever reason, would actually interact with the deceased family, even going as far as to pretend to be an old friend or sometimes even a girlfriend. Karen's self-described addiction extends beyond just physical acts with corpses. To many, she would at times almost come off more like a needy partner, something made even more evident by the fact that sometime after the incident, John McCure's body was to be exhumed and moved to another state, and somehow Karen managed to catch wind of this and actually watched as John's body was dug up and hauled away. Towards the end of the interview, Karen is asked about the prevalence of necrophilia within the funeral home industry, and while it's important to note that she's only a singular source, she claims that, quote, Necrophilia is more prevalent than most people imagine. Funeral homes just don't report it. 
Again, this is just one person's claim, and there isn't much data available on the topic anyway, so let's shift our attention back to Karen. What exactly happened after police found her, and were there legal ramifications? In short, yes, but not in the way that you'd think. Karen ended up pleading guilty to both interfering with a funeral and unauthorized use of the company hearse, but she was never actually charged for having sexual contact with John McCure's corpse. At the time, California had no laws specifically barring acts of necrophilia, and this might come as a shock, but such laws weren't even actually put into place in the state until 2004. As a result of this, Karen was only made to pay a fine of $255, along with an 11-day jail sentence, which John's mother naturally found unacceptable acceptable. She later took both Karen Greenlee and Memorial Lawn Mortuary to court, eventually settling for $117,000 in damages. These days, Karen is supposedly still alive, but she's largely gone off the map and reportedly regrets giving the Apocalypse Culture interview. And what happened after that is unclear, but one can only hope that she never did strike again, even if it is unfortunately wishful thinking. If you've spent any time online at all, then you're probably familiar with the term yandere, most likely due to the prevalence of anime or because of the massive disaster that was yandere simulator. But in case you've only heard the term and don't actually know what it means, in short, it's pretty common within the anime fandom used to describe an oftentimes female character who, upon finding a love interest, slowly turns into a homicidal maniac due to their obsession. If you've ever seen the train wreck that is School Days, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, and you'll know where this segment is going. In general, such characters are nothing but harmless fiction, but what happens when the lines between that and reality begin to blur? This was seemingly the case in May of last year in Tokyo's Shinjuku Ward. Police were called over to an apartment building where a young male had supposedly been attacked, and once they arrived, they happened upon a scene that was both bizarre and chilling. The apartment's lobby area was practically covered in blood, and its source was readily in sight. The injured man was found on his back and almost completely nude aside from his underwear, his stomach area sliced open. Next to him sat a young woman covered in blood. In crime scene photos, she was pictured calmly smoking a cigarette and even chatting on her phone at the same time. If based on her composure you assumed that she was the attacker, then you'd absolutely be correct. But what could drive someone to do such a thing? The woman, now booked for attempted murder, was cooperative and didn't hold back explaining why she had done what she did. Her name was Yuka Takaoka, a 21-year-old bar hostess, and per her statements, the male victim was her very own live-in boyfriend. According to TokyoReporter.com, a local anonymous source claimed that the couple had only lived together for about three days before Yuka supposedly found images of her boyfriend posing with other women, which subsequently led to her attacking while the man slept. Now, for most people, possible infidelity would obviously be very upsetting, but it usually wouldn't result in attempted murder. But further statements provided by Yuka herself would paint a portrait of a very disturbed young woman. Upon arrest, police found a note on her phone, a confession of sorts. Roughly translated, this is what it says. I wanted to be a tragic heroine. How could I make sure he only saw me? The answer was to kill him. If I kill you, it's forever. Nothing will hurt anymore. I don't want anything other than you." The sentiment is pretty much reiterated in statements Yuka herself gave directly to police. She explains that she couldn't help herself due to how much she loved her boyfriend, and that she wanted to die after he did. In most cases, this would be a pretty open-shut case, and legally, of course, it was. She was caught at the scene and even confessed. Her victim luckily survived and eventually recovered, but this isn't the end of the story. When talking about Yuka Takaoka, half of the story is usually about her and what she did, and the other half is her notoriety, which quickly became too prominent to ignore. By the day after the attacks, 
News reports of Yuka's attempt at murdering her boyfriend had already made its way into the news cycle, and by extension, the internet. All over the world, violent killers are usually expected to be scary-looking men, so whenever that expectation isn't realized, people tend to react in a number of ways. I've talked about true crime fandoms on this channel before, and in that case, the most infamous example would probably be Columbiners, aka people who idolize or sometimes even develop emotional attachments to the Columbine shooters. Another few examples would be the likes of Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer, who all had dedicated followings and suitors even during their time in prison. This case was no different as people online took an immediate interest in Yuka, her apparent beauty, and the melodramatic reasoning behind her violence, something many people found eerily similar to the Yandere characters mentioned at the beginning of this segment. Now, it should be noted that when it comes to the internet, it's impossible to tell exactly what people's motivations are or how much of it is sarcasm. In many ways, Yuka Takaoka, or the real-life Yandere as people were calling her, became more of a meme than actually being idolized since the concept of yandere in general is heavily memed even to this day. Nonetheless, there were people out there dedicated to working in her interests, whether genuine or not. A lot of the sentiment was that she was too pretty to be in prison, or that she just did what she did out of love. Fan art was made, and at one point even a successful GoFundMe was created to bail her out, although it was reported and subsequently removed. This, as you can expect, wasn't the only GoFundMe to pop up, but again, it's hard to say for sure how many of these people were joking or scamming versus actually trying to help Yuka. Either way, for better or for worse, this girl was now internationally known and beloved by many. And the fact that this case was popularly tied to Yandere, and by extension anime slash manga, actually has wider implications than one might assume at first. In the West, the term otaku is generally understood to simply mean a fan of anime or manga, while in Japan it's more of a general term akin to nerd. But the word can hold negative connotations. Instead of seeing a fan of popular media as just being that, the quote otaku stereotype conjures up images of someone completely consumed by their media of choice to the point of obsession or even antisocial behavior. To a lot of people, otaku don't fit in with the rest of functioning society, and while not everyone sees it this way, otaku are sometimes blamed for violent crime, which further perpetuates the stigma that somehow being a fan of a certain type of media makes you an unhinged sociopath. A Western parallel to this is a notion that somehow lives on to this day, that violent video games make people violent despite there being absolutely no proof of this. We must stop the glorification of violence in our society. This includes the gruesome and grisly video games that are now commonplace. It is too easy today for troubled youth to surround themselves with a culture that celebrates violence. In the same way, Yuka Takaoka's actions became another talking point for those looking to validate their misconceptions, and at this point there probably isn't much use in trying to change their minds. In late 2019, several months after the attempted murder, Yuka Takaoka would be seen in court crying upon receiving her conviction. She was set to spend three and a half years in prison, and while most who have heard of this case don't know of its outcome, those who do are shocked at how light the sentence turned out to be. For only almost killing someone, this girl is basically going to serve no time at all. And what's most troubling here is that there are some people out there who are patiently waiting for her release. AJ Runaway, St. Maxi, Anthony, Astro, Bloody the Elf, Connor H, Daniel P, Daniel G, David G, DG, sorry, DJX, G-A-M, wait, DJX Gaming, that's what that says, sorry. Eric M, Espernix, Garville B, KMBK Ketchup, Lizatar, Mishi Mishi, Phil K, Ronnie, Saul A, T Gorman, TBF, The Deck of Cards, Tyler T, Zweeches Alice, Zombies Were People 2, AJG, Andrew L, Bad Baphomet, Biznacker, Chris M, David L, Deja, Echo Steel, Elon Musk Musk, Freakazoid, Honeybee, Ish Liebebrot, James M, Jamie M, Longfoot, Luck B, Matt J, Mega Brutal, Nick B, Panda Tiger, Patrick Scarecrow Lasco, Rai S, Sean the CHB, Solar Avalon, SPC Zippo, Tamagotchi Poppy, The Sleep King, The Man in the Crowd, Zarai, Zimbledorf, The Calzone Consumer, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much guys for watching, and if you're still listening right now, I don't know why you are, but you're crazy and I love you and I'll see you guys next time.